I put together a list of every single passage that talks about borrowing and lending procedures, how to go about it. We cover most of those and the few that we didn't, uh, you can find the full list in the show notes page on voluntarytheocracy.org slash 31. And I also have a special opportunity. If you listen through the end of this episode, there's a special project that I'm putting together and I need your help with. So if you'd like to learn more about that, just listen all the way to the end. Yeah, there was one guy that I was talking to who uh, I feel like a lot of people are like, well, the interest rate's so low. I can borrow money at 2 3%. Like, why would I want the hassle of borrowing from another believer? Because, like, now you're, if I, if they don't like how I'm doing business or whatever, like, now there's, there would be conflict involved and it might mm-hmm. get the elder involved and everybody knows how bad elders are at resolving well, conflict in the church. And it just, borrowing money from unbelievers is so much more easy and you, the interest rate's practically nothing. So, and I remember Doug in that talk saying, like, if you're in American business and you haven't gone bankrupt three times, you're not trying. They even have this built-in forgiveness system. Right. So why wouldn't you borrow from some nameless figure who doesn't really care if you make it or not? Right. right. Borrowing from unbelievers is a curse. It's not sinful, but I don't want to sign up for cancer if I can help it. <laughs> so I had all these uh, texts assembled, and it really doesn't take more than about 10 minutes to read through everything, probably just go over one by one. I was talking with a guy just this last Sunday. I mentioned the thing about like how borrowing from unbelievers is a curse. And he said, well, I borrowed, I borrowed some money for my, I think it was for his mortgage from a fellow believer. And I said, is he charging you interest? And he said, uh, I'm paying interest. And I said, of your own free will, or is that like in the contract? All right. And he said, no, it's in the contract. I have to pay interest. And I said this to him. I said, it, isn't that worse than borrowing from an unbeliever? And he said, well, I know it's you can't charge interest to a believer who's poor, but I'm not poor. Mm-hmm. And, and there is one passage that talks about that. It's Exodus uh, 22, 25 through 27. If you lend it to any of my people with you who's poor... You shall not be like a moneylender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that's his only covering. And it's his cloak for his body, and what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So I think that's the one that came to his mind. Mm -hmm. But then there's another one in Deuteronomy that doesn't qualify charging interest to, to to a brother. Deuteronomy 23, 19 to 21 You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that's lent for interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. That's interesting. Even interest on money, uh, which generally would be a business-type opportunity, it seems like. Mm Mm-hmm. And so if you can't charge interest on somebody like, what, like, why would I prefer lending to believers rather than unbelievers if I can get interest from unbelievers, but I can't get anything in return from believers? Right. So, and, and I, I read around the context earlier, it seems like this is, it's pretty clearly what it says. Context is like, this is what you will, if you do these things, this is what, uh, you will be excluded from the assembly. And this is, you know, just one of the things on the list that you're not supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And the other ones are things that we would typically think of as being more serious, probably offenses. But this is among those. So it makes me wonder, okay, well then, what what would be the benefit of preferring to loan to believers rather than to unbelievers? We think of that as bad because if you borrow from an unbeliever, the interest rate's so low, you can just borrow. Right. It's like 2 3%, and that's super affordable. If you can make 5% a year on your money, you're, you're not in the hole borrowing money from, from some bank. But 
that also assumes that inflation is going to be at a standard rate because now that's right. affecting the price of your money. So really, if you combine inflation and the interest rate, it's more like 10%. Because your money's being devalued it's at like seven percent yeah, every it's, year, right? It's, yeah. Even if you break even, your money's worth seven percent less year over year, right. or whatever it is. It right, fluctuates. Right, right. So, but if you had a sound money system where there is no inflation, that would be seen as like you, you mentioned a, de a deflationary right. system, right? But really, it's not deflationary so much as as technology advances and as there are more people, more productive, you've got the same amount of money, a static amount of money relatively, right? out there chasing this, uh, uh, much higher amount of stuff to buy. Right. So your, your dollar or your currency would stretch further over time. It becomes more valuable. So I think there's two ways to look at that, right? Is So that's one way looking at the currency. The other way that was brought up at the men's forum uh, was that if <laughs> if we're lending to a brother, they are using it presumably to build God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Sure, we can lend to an unbeliever and get 5%. Congratulations, right? But if we lend to a believer and they build the God's kingdom, that's so much greater, right? And you, you reap the benefits. So if, if you're lending to them, so they can start a donut shop. You reap the benefits of getting their don't buying their donuts, right? Which you could do with an unbeliever as well, right? But it's building the Christian community and the the community of Christian businesses, and that ties in with the technological deflation, right? As society's improving and building technology and all these other things, even if the technology is just a donut shop, right? It's still improving the amount of goods that are being produced. Talk, talking about America as strictly a nation, if you want to be a true patriot, a true like countryman, American countryman, mm -hmm. you would prefer lending to people who live in America versus lending to people in China. Right. They're your next door neighbor, like they're your first responsibility. Right. And then also, you know, if you want America to do well, then why would you lend? Why would you give preferential lending to unbelievers? You would want to give like a lower interest rate to people that are close to you and would more directly benefit your surrounding economy. Right. So it's sort of the same way saying here, it's like, well, the nation of Israel, which is believers, mm -hmm. believer to believer, that's our nation is God's kingdom. Why wouldn't we give preferential treatment to people who are citizens of the same country with us? Right. And I think that's the same idea. Right. Ultimately we are of God's people before we're of America, right? Right. And so, obviously, Israel was and a I have type. more, in that sense, I have more in common with a believer in exactly. Bangladesh than I do with my next-door unbelieving right. neighbor. Yes. Right. Dennis, I noticed you had a whole bunch of questions. Oh, I just Did have you? things I was writing down today. I don't have necessarily have oh, questions. Okay. They were okay. just different things. I was reading some stuff. Uh, the OPC, back in the late 70s, there was a complaint brought by um, Joseph Braswell, a theonomist, and Dan Dillard, an OPC minister who's theonomically oriented. And they questioned whether or not a church could take could get a loan from a Christian businessman at interest. And they said mm -hmm. their, their view was no. The church's view was yes. Mm. And they said you know, that under and their, their understanding on, on largely theonomic principles was that, no, you can't, that this is forbidden. I mean, if they were, the church can't be charged because it is its own institution. It's its own law sphere. Mm -hmm. It can't, it doesn't operate as a business. It doesn't work right. with commercial transaction ideas. It's, you know, it's, it's financing should come from the tithe and from offerings. It shouldn't be looking for other things outside. So, you know, hmm. it should, it's thought, thought should be from within, and, and how can we generate the money from within? Uh, instead of looking, even, even from a Christian businessman, no, you know, because that involves, obviously, because yeah, you, you get into the difference, is, is it an investment that they're doing, or, they, or is it a fixed rate mm. loan, where whether you, whether it succeeds or not, you owe me my extra money. Right. Whereas if you're investing, you're saying, we're in with you, 
If and if fail, you fail, we all fail. We all fail. If we were to succeed, we all succeed. So mm -hmm. again, you get into that distinction, um, whether or not that's a good thing for the church to do or not, or whether or not that's even what the, I mean, obviously it works out further, but at least minimally within, you know, the church itself, what is allowable and what is not. I mean, it doesn't say that you can, can never lend, because obviously you can lend to one another, but the question is, is whether or not you're doing it to deal with a person in their, in a problematic state, or people who are just saying, well, hey, we, if we build a bigger parking lot, more people will show up. Mm -hmm. Well, is that really, I mean, you, you, you have to then ask, what is the good of the, the thing itself? And is, is it something that's really for good, or is it just, you're just looking for avenues, you know, to increase your little kingdom here or whatever? Right. Well, and that was another thing that, that uh, was mentioned at the men's forum. The benefit would be, well, okay, so if you can't loan an, to another believer and charge interest to just make money, and you can completely ignore whether the, the fact of, like, is he, is he profitable or not. Mm -hmm. It's just, I get my money just for not having access to my money. I make money off of that. Whether you lose money with it or, or do a good job, I get my same amount. So there's no risk lending to that person there versus if you lend to a believer hopefully you would i mean the spirit of a nation is that like we all share risk together mm -hmm. like if somebody if, if uh, somebody down the street gets arrested and goes to jail i'm paying for that so that hurts me a little bit so it's supposed to make me go okay well we're all connected like i don't just get to say oh that person is completely separate and he him crashing and burning has no effect on me whatsoever well Economies like that everything has a ripple effect and affects everybody else at least a little now It may just be a few cents of sales tax when I go to the store mm -hmm. But over time that adds up to the to where I'm like, okay over the course of my lifetime I will have paid for two people to sit in prison for their entire lifetimes. Yeah, uh, and that's just spread evenly throughout everybody like that's right. God judging the nation as a whole Same thing with inflation. It just like it hits everybody a little bit Right. But like as believers, let's say somebody's doing really good in business and wants a loan. Well, then other people invest and now they're in it with him. Mm -hmm. Now you've, you would ideally want to have some shared information. Here are the things that we're doing that lend itself to us making profit. Right. And now you have that information too, which is valuable. And that's where they, they were recommending instead of a loan where you don't share the risk. Sure, there's societal shared risk that trickle down, whatever, but they were recommending, oh, what about selling stock, selling ownership of this company for capital? And that way, everyone who buys into it really truly buys into it and shares the risk and also the rewards mm -hmm. instead of it being one-sided. And then also part of sharing ownership means that they're more motivated to help in other ways so not just funding, but they're going to try and really understand your business. They're going to try and help in whatever capacity they have because they're part owners now. And if something happens that causes them to lose, all of a sudden everybody's going to be interested. Like, what happened? When there's a fire, everybody wants to know what was the cause of the fire. So it's when there's a mistake, that's the learning opportunity for everybody to be like, oh, these are the errors that I need to avoid. I need to, I need to pay attention because I was invested in that. It was my money that, like, that hurt me. People remember things that they did that hurt themselves. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Just automatically. You don't have to sit them down in the classroom and say, now here, now this is why you should remember. No, 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 they'll remember. They lost $10,000 in the 2008 crash or they lost half their life savings or whatever it was. They remember. They remember what not to do next time, hopefully. And yet here we are 15 years yeah. later. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ready to relearn everything we earned, learned, <laughs> allegedly. Obviously, that gets into the borrowing and lending, too, is issues of bankruptcy and of insolvency. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how much, how much as a Christian are you obligated to help a person who is just digging themselves in further and further? Again, they're, if they're a brother... Because they know they're going to get yeah. forgiven after yeah. six years or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, the law was to forgive everything every 50 years and every seven years the the jubilee 50th year was for land to revert back right right so, so in which case really you really stuff. couldn't sell land 
permanent. There's a verse that says you cannot sell land in perpetuity for the right. land is mine, says the Lord. Right. So land purchases would revert. So basically God said, all right, everybody in this land, and I'm really not sure how that all that stuff is going right. to work out today. Right. Like, but, but I haven't been get, given an allotment with like a latitude and longitude right. coordinates. Like essentially but at the, the very Jews least, were. we know there's a principle of forgiveness mm -hmm. um, for debts. Right. There was a difference between debts for foreigners and then sure. fellow Hebrew slaves. Sure. Fellow Hebrew slave could be enslaved at, a, at most for six and go free in the seventh. Right. Now, if the yes. 50th Jubilee year was only two years away, then whenever he got into debt, he could only be enslaved for a max of two years. Right. And then so free. maybe let's go over that a little bit because the debt system was so different then than it is now mm -hmm. and yet somewhat the same, right? So what, what we do is we pile up credit card debt and then go broke, right? But what they did is they would pile up debt until they couldn't pay it anymore. They would have to sell if they didn't have any other things to sell, they would sell themselves into slavery. Mm -hmm. And that would pay off the debt. And the maximum amount was seven years. So right. in the end, the debt would be paid off every seven years. It would be forgiven, although there was... Uh, slavery was always involved, on the table. Right. Th there was some level of paying it back. Right. Instead um, of a, all right, it, well, I've hit rock bottom, so now I say this and now... Yeah, I'm free. Yeah, it's not just like, okay, I declare bankruptcy. I guess I'm I'm done. It's like, oh, I'm I'm bankrupt. I'm going to go work for this other guy yeah. for nothing for so, at least a few years and then I'll be free. I'll so be So it's forgiven. like when you declaring bankruptcy wasn't the end of your debts. It began a cycle of slavery yeah. that ended had the a limit increase of the debt. That, that began yeah. some kind of restitution right. realization that right. you have you built this up so much, it's not as if we just simply you know, zero out your account and let you start all over mm -hmm. again. Right. You know, you're going to spend the next you know, six months, five years. However long it takes you. Know, whatever, whatever we, wherever we are on the cycle. Now, hopefully right. within an agrarian society, there's going to be a little bit more oversight. People are going to notice, hey, so-and-so keeps you know, doing this and that and the other, and he just... <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's much like the things about whether or not you, you have to marry a rapist. Well, no, the father doesn't have to necessarily give his daughter completely, but they also know much more about each other, whereas now we live in a very anonymous society where people don't know each, each other very well. There's issues involved in that which don't appear to us because, you know, they, well, why should you give your daughter to the rapist? Well, back then you had a closer knowledge of And she people. was probably never going to have an opportunity to get married. She certainly right. couldn't marry a priest. But yeah, there's already limitations happening, but there's also, there's also a, a closer neighborly knowledge. There's, the community knows more about what's going on mm -hmm. than they, they would in a modern society, which is why people get so up in arms, feminists get up in arms about those kinds of verses. Well, we'd right. have to ask more questions nowadays to, to figure out whether or not how we should apply that. People are gonna notice, hey, he just keeps failing and failing with whatever he's doing. He just keeps showing up you know, to, to need more money for this. Why is it you're failing? Why is this going bad? Are you just a lousy farmer? Are you a lousy? But again, it, the seven year cycle limits both the accrual of the debt and also the amount of time you would have to pay it off. But people would also right. know somewhere along the way, wait, but this is this doesn't make any sense. He keeps showing up every six months for more money because he his cattle keep dying on him left mm -hmm. and right. Well, why is that? There's another thing related to that where you've got masters who, if they basically win the, the hearts of their slaves, like let's say a slave, this is his fourth time. Right. He's in his mid-40s or something. He's been going into debt and or stealing, and mm -hmm. he keeps going in, and this is his fourth time being forgiven of this. Let's say he eventually finds, I don't know how common this would be, but if a slave loved his master at a certain point, he could say, you know what, I want to I want to be this guy's slave forever. That's how much I love my master. That's how good he's been to me. So in that sense, because that's an option, if you want free, cheap, perpetual slave labor, mm -hmm. you got to be the best master because <laughs> then you right. might have people actually take you up on that. Right. Oh, yeah, the, the bankruptcy thing. Is, is super interesting just because I think when I first realized some of this stuff, you, you start to get like very opinionated really quickly. 
until you get slapped upside the head enough times mm -hmm. to realize there's always an exception. Like the law, it, it's like a living thing. There's there's a cycle. You might be at one end and it be good, but there's also an opposing end that kind of counterbalances it all the time. I used to be like, there should be no bankruptcy because it encourages people to borrow with abandon. If you took completely took the forgiveness possibility aspect away from it, people would be so bar scared to ever borrow money mm -hmm. because it would mean they become a slave forever. Nobody would ever borrow anything. Nobody would ever take any risk because the, the risk of failure was too great and too horrible of a consequence. So there does need to be some sort of a system of forgiveness. It's just that bankruptcy well, kind of nods the head to it, but then does it in a really bad, unhealthy way. And it, it has to be an absolute forgiveness too, right? Not just a, oh, I guess you're forgiven, but you still we owe still a hold favor, a grudge, or you still hold a grudge, yeah. And because again, the point of Jubilee and the point of the seven years of forgiveness was looking forward to Christ, right? Mm -hmm. It's looking forward to a true form of forgiveness, and the Israelites were supposed to practice this to ingrain it into their lives, right? To so they would concept. recognize so when they would recognize when the Messiah did come. They would be like, oh, that's why we've been doing these things this way. And they'll recognize it in him when they see it. Right. Kind of the question is, how much of the law continues on, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, the law was given to foreshadow, yes. But also the law was given because it was good, mm -hmm. right? And it seems like the economic aspects of the law seems like they, they're good. They aren't simply ceremonial. They don't seem that way at all. It's a good system, right? And so it, it would seem that we we are still bound by those laws. There's nothing that really... Yeah, the New Testament, it would seem it speaks in kind of contradictory terms because it says we're dead to the law. Yeah. And also if the funny thing is that when you obey it, you're not under it. Right. Right. But if you disobey it, then you're under it. Sure. Uh, and yeah. the end of Romans chapter 3 says, we establish the law. But then in Romans, it also says that if we're in Christ, we're dead to it. So we right. establish something we're dead to. And it's this really counterintuitive thing. Like yeah. the more you hate God and reject his ways, the more his ways force themselves on you. Right. As and the more, the more you follow his ways, the more blessings you and, and And the less restrictive they become. Right. And you find the freedom in them. Right. God judges people by them in hopes that they'll learn to judge themselves by them. That's the ideal. Like, if you'll just realize what the answers are that I'm giving you and apply them to yourselves, I won't have to hit you anymore. <laughs> right. So if we move forward to the New Testament verses about loans, it's almost like it's an even more extreme version of the Old Testament, right? Yeah, it kind of takes it up a notch. Yeah. In some cases, um, the New Testament might seem to bring it down a notch from the law, but in most cases, it really kicks it up. Adultery is bad in the old law, but now in the with what Jesus tells us is that if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, that is adultery. So it's a much larger hurdle, right? Mm -hmm. Much more restrictive. Yeah, yeah, much, yeah, exactly. Because now it's, it's telling but you what you're supposed to At the to same think. time, it's much more freeing, right? In the same way. And so when it comes to money, what it says is give to a brother without expecting them to give it back, right? Without asking for them to give it back, which is like, oh, not only am I not making money, but I'm losing money. And what that tells me is that, oh, the blessing is in the giving, right? We aren't giving to make interest like we were talking about earlier. We're giving so that they can build a company that improves my life, right? Mm -hmm. And them being a Christian brother will want to give it back to me, right? And they may want to give it back to me with interest. There's nothing forbidding that. Right. There's only forbidding asking for interest. There's nothing forbidding paying interest. Mm -hmm. And the standard for that is basically, as I've loved you, mm -hmm. do the same. Like, right. I've forgiven you this. And not only did I forgive you your debts, I gave you assets. 
That's right. what God did for us. Now, obviously, we're supposed to be treat it like a servant master relationship, where you know, if we want to be great, we become a servant of all, and we become a servant of God. God gives us all this stuff. Do we multiply it faithfully or not, and willing to give it back with the extra work that we put into it? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we used to be slaves and sojourners in Egypt. So don't begrudge a sojourner with you now. I forgave you all of your debts and gave you assets. So you forgive other people their debts and give them assets. And so it's like you have everybody giving to everybody else. Right. Specializing in labor and... And remembering that, just, that you should not follow the example of the Egyptians and, may, and make other people have to make bricks without straw. You have to also supply them the straw. You have to give them the means towards those ends. You can't, you can't, since redo what happened to you, you've got to go the exact opposite way and make sure that you're helping others. Not just a matter of avoid of, you know, using some of your abilities, but not all of them. It's just make, making it very clear that you're going to help your brothers and also those around you. I mean, you know, there's an extension of, of it to, to the neighbor to the foreigner, the sojourner, things like that, different ways that we treat them slightly different, but there's always the willingness to help. When a person is, is in a problematic state, we should be more readily, now it may be that a person who is a sojourner or someone who is a foreigner, you're not gonna see them, so there, there can be an, an exaction of interest, but you don't have to. It's not a commandment that you must exact interest. You can, because obviously you don't have the close relationship, they're going to leave eventually, they're going to return to wherever they were at. And so, you know, there's a recognition that there's a certain, you know, carrying fee that has to be, that it is there, but obviously if they walk away, well, then you say, well, then that's on them and and God will deal with them in time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the same, you're also recognizing like it's also, it's also unbelievers. reducing to some degree your ability to help those around you. So it's right. saying, okay, there's a distinction not a separation between the two. You don't want to treat these as two different classes of people, but it's a recognition that this person, okay, they I've given them funds or some means to help them in their problematic state, but that also takes away from my ability to help here. So there's there's it's okay to do okay. that, but it's not a necessity. And that's always the issue is it's not necessary always to exact an interest or a punishment or something like that. It's available. Mm -hmm. The law makes it available as a means you know, to deal with this issue, whether it's a punishment or a fee or a fine. Or yeah, something. you can always go beyond, yeah. but you can never go below the right. absolute bottom minimum requirements that the law has. If God just says that we're supposed to give everything away, why don't I just like withdraw all my money from the bank and just throw it out the window? And whoever picks it up, like, great, you know. But there's all, you also have to balance that with the verses that talk about like a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You can't do it to the point where you're neglecting the responsibilities that you have. Like if you don't provide for the members of your own household, you've denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. So obviously there's your bare minimum. Like you can't go beyond that. But then at the same time, as long as you're providing and you're working to build an inheritance for your children's children, I would say... As long as you've got that covered, there's no limit on what you can right. do, what you can give away. Well, also within wisdom. Mm -hmm. Like we don't want to be enabling right. people. If somebody asks you for something, you don't have to give them what they're asking for. Right. You can give them what they actually need right. instead. And that's something that I learned in just, that's playing good business practices. If somebody walked into an ER and said, hey, doc, I need a triple bypass. When can, <laughs> when can we start? Can we schedule something for this afternoon? The doctor's going to say, no, <laughs> you're not a doctor. I don't, trust, I don't trust what you're guessing that you need. I'm going to make sure you need it because it's going to cost me something and right. possibly kill you right. if I do exactly what you ask me. There's always wisdom that you have to apply when people ask you for things. When people ask you for money, it's, it's never money that they need. Mm -hmm. It's always what do they want to use the money for. Right. And if they're not willing right. to tell you that, then... They don't need it. <laughs> they don't need it. <laughs> yeah. When I was a deacon in the OPC and I went to the conference a few years ago, one of the things they stressed was anyone who just shows up on Sunday and says, I need $500, they're going to kick me out of my apartment tomorrow. No. <laughs> 
you never give cash. I mean, there may be a situation where you say, well, you need $20 for gas. But for the most part, you can then say, I'll show up with, we, we will show up at the Social Security office or we'll show up at welfare services, whatever it is. Tomorrow, I'll be there at nine o'clock. I'll be there with you. We'll go in and we'll start working through this thing because everything takes time. I mean, no landlord is just going to, I mean, I mean, it could be a situation where you spent the last six months fighting him over this whole thing, and he literally is going to tomorrow morning. But for the most part, people are never there at the last minute. They're there at the, this, this looks convenient. This is a great big church. They must have a lot of money. So let's you know, go in and find the deacon, find somebody, and see if we can get some cash out of them. But yeah, you never do that, but you're, you're always willing to do some measure of service. You're willing to w walk with them through you know, whatever the social services thing, because you know, you're already familiar with it. You know people there. They know you. You know you're here just, you're trying to help. And what do they have to do to deal with their, their issue? Instead of just taking them at face value, and then they walk out and they head down to the place where all the drugs are at. Things like, or whatever purpose. There was a lady that asked the church for money, mm -hmm. but she was also on welfare. And they didn't begrudge her that, but they said, God's people, we're your national welfare system mm -hmm. now. Yeah. You can't double dip. Right. You can't get Chinese and American welfare and British welfare. And like, you can't just go out and sign up for every country's right. welfare system. Like, you're one nation's responsibility. And right. so, if you're a believer, we will help you pay for your kids' education. We'll make sure you have a place to stay and a place to eat, and those things will never be taken out from under you as long as we have anything to say about it. And to get access to all of this, you have to stop taking mm. welfare. Yeah, I think the church and has the lady abdicated. The lady wouldn't do it. Right. Even though they were offering her more. Mm -hmm. well, what, in more one in sense, quality, at least. Better, well, definitely better quality. And it was, I think it was also going to amount to a greater Probably dollar amount. More dollar amount, yeah. They're offering right. her to like join a homeschool co op, which costs right. more than public school. She wouldn't do it. That says a lot about why are, why are these people in the church and they call themselves your fellow Christians, but they don't want to actually partner with you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they won't take stuff that you want to give to them. Yeah, there's an element of responsibility that you would have. I mean, when in the in the welfare agency and things like in the welfare system, there isn't the level of responsibility. You you right. you, you have a caseworker. They have 85 other people that they're dealing with. Somebody was talking about there's been over a trillion dollars that because nobody's minding the, the storefront, they're just sending checks to people that say they need this money for a prosthetic limb from people who have all their limbs. Wow. And <laughs> Yeah, nobody's looking. Well, they found some doctor, obviously, to, to, to I mean, I, I wouldn't mind a putting, third Are there limb. people putting other people, oh, but then yeah. saying, yeah, send yeah, the yeah. money to me? Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Over a trillion dollars has been abused out wow. of that. Wow. And that was just for medical stuff. That wasn't for, like, food stamps. Like, I can't imagine. Probably it's more for food stamps. Oh, yeah. The good thought behind it is we'll give these people the money, and then they should learn to exercise responsibility. Well, we were in a situation where we were renting a house and uh, through another party, and the people stopped. When we took the house back over, they stopped paying because the money came to them. The title, Section 10 or whatever, whatever it is, handles that. They send the money to the individual so they will learn responsibility okay. and accountability. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then it doesn't show up in my... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't come ever to me. Right. It's the, like yeah, the government... Isn't isn't the person to teach responsibility? Yeah, yeah, right? They're, that's not their job, and so we, the church, has abdicated all these different things, including welfare, and now we're wondering both sides. Right? One is why is the welfare system so corrupt, and two is why do so many people need actual <laughs> where, welfare as well? Like, there's so much money flowing one direction. And yet, it's not getting to the people who actually need it, on the other hand. Well, it's because it's not the government's job, it's our job, and we just gave it away. Mm -hmm. right. What's the, you know, you go to the zoo and it says, don't feed the animals, <laughs> or or, uh, eat, or if you're in the wild, you're not supposed to feed the animals because they'll become dependent on handouts, and right. mm -hmm. they'll die as soon as the handouts stop. Well, it's sort of like that now. If you were to stop 
Like, can you imagine the outcry that would happen if you stopped all food stamp payments and even gave people plenty of notice? Said, hey, two years, that's the maximum that you can right. be on it mm-hmm. one time and never again, or and we're going to stop it after 10 years for forever. There would be riots uh, in well, the streets yeah. because people, there are a lot of people out there that are living, I mean, I think the majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Right. And if you do one little thing to upset, they have a flat tire or something, they're, right. they're completely broke. Yeah. So why do people not have any money in savings? Well, part of that's due to inflation. <laughs> right. Let's say I give you 100 bucks yeah. and say, if you spend it today, yeah. you can buy a car with this. Yep. But if you wait till tomorrow, you, you can only buy a candy bar with it. Right. Everybody's going to spend buy a car immediately. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's going to ha- keep anything because it's literally just dissolving out of their fingers. Right. Yeah, so it, you can't blame the average person for spending money as soon as they get their paycheck because that's how our system's built. Um, you had said you had pulled all the all the verses. Did, you want to go to the next one? Well, no, I'm curious. Did you grab Leviticus 19 uh, verses 35 and 36? Did that? I wonder if that popped up in your search, and I think maybe it didn't. It did not. I have Leviticus 25. So All right. What was that one? Yeah, Le- Leviticus 20, probably verse, uh, sorry, Leviticus 19, verses 35 and 36. Uh, and I can read it right now. It's going to be, uh, you shall do no wrong in judgment, in me- measurement of weight or capacity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, which is their currency, right? It's a um, measurement of either weight or volume. Okay, okay. And a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. Okay, I did not have that in my search, but it's definitely been related. We've been talking enough about inflation. Right, exactly. And so my contention when we were talking a month ago about this was that... Bitcoin. <laughs> right, we, is that the U.S. dollar is not a just balance. It's not just weights. So weights is where it would be, they weighed out gold or silver, Mm -hmm. right? And that was their currency. So this is literally God telling us, telling Israel at least, and I would assume it applies equally to us. It would apply to any nation. um, That you shall have just currency system. The US dollar is anything but that, right? They can print it whenever they want. There's not even a federal body governing it they don't um, even the have Fed to print is it. just they can a group quantitative of easing is just they literally key dollar right. amounts. They type it in and, and they there's and, not even enough appears, paper dollars right. to back what what shows And there's up. no court of appeals. <laughs> you can't go you can't sue the Fed um, as far as I know. You can audit. It's been audited finally. Yeah. Yeah, but again, it there's no appeal and it's not just, right? In the sense of it's not a weight in fact, it's purposefully made to inflate to mm-hmm. so they can make more of it and devalue it. So instead of it being a just scale, it's a scale that always tips one way. Right. And that way... You put your is, money on this side and it slides over to the other exactly. side. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That way is the government, right? It's They're constantly siphoning money. Mm-hmm. value from everyone's money into their coffers and which they can spend on even if you want. want to put it in stock or bitcoin or something like that there's the standard that they tax you by is still the dollar yeah so if you ever bring it if you ever change its form back to anything else It'll even though taxed on. you got the same amount of stock and let's say the company has flatlined yeah over time or it's silver right you literally just have one ounce of silver mm-hmm. right Oh, but now that silver is worth... Because it gained in value, which it didn't. It's a just just measure. It's the same amount. There's just more dollars out there chasing that silver. Because because they printed more money, now they say they can tax you on that. Because you made money on that. Because you made (laughs) dollars on it. I don't care about dollars. I don't even want a dollar. I just want silver. (laughs) Um, But... um, They've made it, it to be inescapable. And in one sense... But it's, it seems like this, in this case, the curse is the sin, right? It says, you shall have just weights or measures. If you don't, 
that's a curse in itself, mm -hmm. right? But now this curse, we'd say, okay, we'd like to get out from under this. We'd like to obey this and have just weights and measures. Right. You'll get slapped on the wrist now. Right. Well, and it affects that. everything, right? So it affects what we started with, which was loans. Mm -hmm. If I loan you $100 and you pay me back $100 next year, so we're using real terms. Say I loaned you $100 a year ago today, mm -hmm. and you paid it back to me today, I lost 7.9% of the value. That's the official inflation number, CPI numbers. 7.9% mm -hmm. just for loaning to my brother with no interest, mm -hmm. right? So what the government is doing and society as a whole by putting up with it and allowing it and not questioning it by using the US dollars we are making it harder to obey God's law in these other places. Whereas if I had loaned you silver a year ago and you pay it back, it's the exact same thing. I'm happy, right? I'm good. You didn't lose anything. I didn't lose anything. Right. And if I did a good job with using what you lent me, yeah. there's more stuff out there for that silver to purchase. Right. And so my silver goes up in value. Even ignoring dollars, printing dollars, my silver has gone up in value because society as a whole there's has gone up in value. There's more stuff out there for you to buy. Yes. For the same, and there's only still the same amount of silver in existence. Right. They mine a little bit more, but I mean, comparatively. It's very small. Yeah. Comparatively, we're good. And so by loaning to people silver without interest, I'm gaining value even if they don't pay me interest. By loaning dollars with no interest, I'm losing value. Right. We, t we take a really basic commandment, like have just weights and measures. Mm -hmm. We take that for granted, and a lot of Christians, I think, assume we do, right? They assume nobody's cheating the, the, the system. <laughs> we all use in the same dollar. No, because the same dollar this year is different from it's technically the same dollar last year, but it's it's different. It's not the same thing. It's, I heard somebody say that they printed more of it. Forty percent of all of the money ever printed in the United States history was printed in the last eighteen months. Yeah, which by now it's the last two years. Yeah, basically since COVID. Yeah, and it gets crazy when you look into the history of the dollar. In the seventies, apparently, the government forced people to turn over their gold. Four dollars, which I was never taught that. Right. It's insane to think they confiscated that, that all the privately held gold in the entire United States. Yeah, they said, except, we will take you to except jail. for jewelry, technically. And so some people weren't bothered by that because they weren't investors or whatever. But how how was I not told that? How? <laughs> and so so they took a just system and replaced it under threat of imprisonment, they replaced it with an unjust system, and somehow everyone just ignored it. And part of me goes, it's a marvel that there is no escape from this. It's like, if we won't govern ourselves, God will find a way to knock us upside the head to try to get our attention. Yeah. The scary thing is, is that we're so numb because we don't right. understand we scripture. Don't, we don't see it. The government can whack us upside the head with something like that, and we all <laughs> and go, we feel it. that's okay. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, in one sense, the purpose of the law is to make us humble and realize that, oh, you have a problem. Yeah. Jesus is the solution, but what good is a solution if you don't have a problem? Right. If, if a guy showed up here at my house and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I've got a, a, a paint kit. I'm here. I, I can. All this stuff, it's free. You can completely repaint your house. And I'm like, uh, it looks painted to me. <laughs> like, right. That would be kind of an, actually an inconvenience for you to come in and paint. It would smell. Right smell bad and like I'd have to move my furniture around like that I'm I'm good but if I realize there's no paint on my walls there's wires hanging out and are visible and people my kids drew on the wall or whatever if I had kids then I'd be like oh thanks like please come right. in like I'm right. glad somebody sent you over here we can trace problems in our society back to not following the law that otherwise we're like we didn't even realize were problems Mm -hmm. Yeah, the consequences, they, they always hit us, but it's, do we realize that this is a bad thing or not? Thy words are a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. It gives you discernment to know, 
to be able to see something bad coming from a long way away. I'm going to have to avoid that when it gets close to me as I'm walking down the path versus you're walking and then don't even realize that you've stepped in something nasty because you couldn't see it. Right. And it's like, well, you're supposed to be able to see bad stuff coming from a long way away. Right. Or if not, you're at least supposed to listen to the people who do see it. Sure. And, and pay some attention to that. Mm-hmm. To be able to say, if somebody says, something's coming down the pipeline 50 years from now and here's why, you're supposed to have enough discernment to be, oh, actually, he's right. Because Let's look into it. He's, he's arguing from the same principles that I hold and he's thought about this versus, oh, I completely disagree with his principles. It doesn't really matter. We're not even starting from, we don't have the same worldview. Mm -hmm. So I can't really trust his conclusions because we don't have the same starting point. Back when Ralph Nader had his book that came out, Unsafe at Any Speed, someone said Lee, Lee Iacocca's response to it was, give him leather. People like the shiny and good smell of leather in their cars. They'll ignore the issue of the unsafe at any speed because they have something nice and shiny and beautiful and all the rest. People get caught up in the, if I, if I, if, if you get $10,000 worth of credit card debt, but I got all this nice stuff. I've got this car. I've got this stereo system. I've got these nice things in my house, but I won't ever be able to pay for them. And next month, you know, someone's going to come in and repossess everything out of me. But you, know, you, you, you like the short-term gain, the, the nice smell, the nice look. It looks like as if you're prosperous. I remember people. But the tax man cometh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or people who would buy these half million dollar houses back in the 80s and 90s, but they'd have no furniture in them because they couldn't afford. They could only afford the, the mortgage payment. They can't afford to put anything in the house. Or if they do, they have a bare minimum. They rent. If they have people over, they they go to um, what is it that? There's a rent-a-place, rent-a-center, whatever, and they get their furniture or whatever and their stereo system, and they rent it for the weekend, then they return it all. Or as they used to do with my father-in-law, they go to the um, place he was working at. I worked at, did carpeting and furniture and things like that, and they would say, I'd like, you know, this, that, I want these things. Send them to my place, and then they would return them the next day or after the weekend. So they would do all these things that make them look like as if they're prosperous. But then on Monday, it all go back to the place, and, and they wouldn't be out the money because they probably charged it on their credit card or whatever. So then you, know, you got to, if it's back within a few days, almost any transaction is you got a three day limit. You can return it if you don't want it, puppies or vacuum cleaners or whatever. Mm -hmm. You have up to three days to return it, and you know there's no no harm. I mean, it burns the salesman, but <laughs> that's not your problem. <laughs> I'm fascinated when I'll do DoorDash deliveries. Mm. A lot of the deliveries are to what, trailer parks mm -hmm. and mobile homes. And I'm always fascinated by the nice cars that I see there. Mm. And these people, they're living in complete dumps. There's just junk all over their porch. Like, you can have a mobile home and keep it nice. Like, right. yeah. You, you oh, get, yeah. But so many people don't. And then they buy a nice car because it makes them feel rich right and they get to have nice things well and they buy delivery on their food and they yeah because and they, they spend feels double even richer even though they have a nice car that they could drive right they have a nice car that they could get and go to sonic or whatever but they're willing to play like fast food is already expensive versus like making just like, oh, yeah, buy a can of soup <laughs> and heat it up right. at your house you're going to yeah. spend a third even still yeah. um like not to mention like actually buying fruits and vegetables and chopping them up and they're already buying something expensive, and then they have it delivered. I don't really, it doesn't baffle me at all that they're living in a mobile home. Well, and the food that they're ordering is priced slightly higher than as if you went in the place itself. Right. Because you know, it's got to get delivered. The menu is always right. higher price than the in-store menu. Right. Because DoorDash takes a 15% cut, yeah. and then you tip yeah. on top of that, if, if you tip at all. Well, and yeah, some of them think, oh, well, I'm saving money, but, they, but they've already spent what they would have cost them to go drive there and come back if right. they had just gone there. But they don't think about, no one thinks about that until you actually compare the two menus and say, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or happen to know the prices. Of the and it's items. only, it, I've had, it's, it's happened quite a few times where somebody will order food from a place that's literally within walking distance mm, yeah. from their mobile yeah, home yeah, yeah, yeah. and they will order delivery. 
Yeah. And they have a nice car in the driveway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Even if we wanted to go back to the just weights and measures, like mm-hmm. we we couldn't. Or there would be significant hurdles and extra costs to, well, to doing things that so way. So I wouldn't put it that way. I would say it would be a long road, mm-hmm. right? It's not that it's impossible or that there's hurdles. Of course there's hurdles, right? It's just a long road, but it's possible, right? That's the difference. It's, it's a way of phrasing it. It's like, if we honestly work towards it, we could probably be there in 10 years. But if we don't work towards there's it such because a, it's too hard, there's such a few we'll never number of be people there. who actually want to start going sure. this direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. also like, obviously, if everybody was on board with it, like it could be there, really w- there would be silver testing machines at every cash register in the United States no, within a couple but, of years. But, but things are changing around the world so fast already, right? So the Canadians had their bank account seized if they rented a hotel in Ottawa during a certain date, right? Because they were obviously there for the protests and therefore they can seize their bank account. No judge, no jury. That changes the mindset. It's, it's the flowering of where this unjust system has been going this whole time, right? It's the flowering of that. It's the end road of that. And as that comes more and more real, as that blossoms, which might be their wrong, <laughs> wrong metaphor, but as the, the, the crookedness blossoms, right? Um, more and more people are turning to Bitcoin as because I think it fits the criteria for adjust weights and measures. Silver and gold are easier for some people. Bitcoin's easier for other a different subset of people, but they're both legitimate, right? Just weights and measures. They have better use cases for different things. But my point is people are, I mean, some people are already forced in Canada. Some people, they're never going to use a bank again. They may never use the Canadian dollar again just because they can't trust it. Even that's if they, a possibility. Even yeah. if they allow, even if they're allowed their bank account again, maybe they have been. I haven't kept up with the news. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to want to, right? And so you say, oh, there's not a majority of us out there who want to use a just weights and measure system. But my point is, as the crooked system blossoms, more and more people will and are at an extremely rapid pace. Oh, that's definitely true. And in that sense, it's good that somebody already had the idea to, to make something like cryptocurrency, right. to give another option. Right. That's, yeah, it uh, makes that it way that easier. Requires it's already a, been... That requires a lot of work and a lot of wisdom right. to be able to see something coming and say, oh, hey, there's technology out there that we can solve that with. Right. That's one of the biggest things, my philosophy about how to change people's mind. You don't attack their position. You offer them a better one. Right. And Bitcoin is that better one. You don't have to say, right. here's Bitcoin. I made an account for you. I've already you know, given you this much in your account. All you have to do is claim it. Uh-huh. It's, you know, you make a boat. Yeah. And then when people realize that they're on a sinking ship, they'll swim so over they to will. you. You yeah. don't have to force right. anybody exactly. to do anything. Exactly. And that's the genius of it. Right. I'll jump to the next verse here. Yeah. Um, this was an interesting one. This one's not so much a, a requirement for like interest related, but it's a really interesting uh, regulation on pr- like the procedure of it. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 13. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house to collect his pledge or the, the collateral. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And if he's a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. And it be righteousness mm-hmm. for you before the Lord your God. It's an interesting thing. That is interesting. Like, why can't you go in? Let's, let's say, okay, you lent this guy 500 bucks. Yeah. And so... In one sense, it's kind of like pawning something. He's got to give you something in return. Right. So if he defaults, yep. you get to keep whatever. Yep. And it would be typically worth the same or more than right. what he lent you so that he'd be sure to pay it back. Right. So let's say he's going to lend you a $1,000 speaker. You don't get to go into his house and take it. 
Yeah. You have to stand outside and he's got to bring it out to you. You're not permitted to go into his house right. and take it. It's like, it's like here's, here's the bottom that somebody can sink to in society. Mm -hmm. Your creditors can't come into your house and take their collateral from yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the limit. The front door of your house is the limit. People can't come inside right. and take your stuff. Like You yeah. still have a base level of honor that you can't drop below. I, I know a lot of Christians that they're so hard into the word capitalism uh -huh. that things like this actually kind of grate on them. Right. Like the idea of gleaning and that if somebody's poor, you owe him food. If he doesn't have enough to eat, you owe him food or you owe him an opportunity to work, to go glean in a field or something right. like that. Right, right, right. That, gets, that raises people's hackles a lot, I've uh -huh. found. Yeah. Because to tell you that you owe something to somebody that you don't, that's a stranger to you, that you don't right. know, just because of their status. Right. But at the same time, creditors owe respect, right, to the people. They give you the collateral back at the end of the day if it's right. like your only garment that you have. Right. You're allowed, they can't to come in and take your, your sheets. Right. Like, that's the limit. You got to have a place to sleep. You got to have the ability to work. Yeah. I don't know if I could go as far as to say you are owed a roof over your head. <laughs> yeah, but I mean almost, right? But, but yeah, it, it's he's got to be able to like. he's got to be able to sleep somewhere. That sleeping is literally mentioned by name. If he's a poor right. man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. You shall restore to him the pledge as the sun sets, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you and bless you. So yeah, you've got it's like the you gotta totally have a place to lie down. Opposite mindset, because you know there's the shows of like the repo shows, the, the lizard lip towing or whatever. Yeah, go in and and take it, take the car or whatever, because you know the person isn't giving it to them. I'm sure there's there's more on what would happen if a person didn't give something that they were supposed to give, but in this case, the repo guy is supposed to knock on the door and say, hey, bring it out to me. Bring me the keys. Right. Yeah, yeah. Instead, of, gonna... instead of having to do yeah. anything like potentially damage. Right. Cars thing. cars kind of different, right? Because it's well, outside. They can take it without but the let's key. so let's say let's say it's your refrigerator or, or right? right or your TV, right? You knock on the door and say, hey, bring it out here. It that I I just had a funny visual in my head for like what that TV show would be. <laughs> well, it couldn't actually be a TV. Right. But like so a that's TV, in the case a TV of the poor would not man, be something right? that you have to restore to him at sunset. No, no, no. Yeah. So that's in the case of the poor man. But the stand outside and wait is whether they're poor or not. So a TV, you stand, you, you knock. But yeah, if it's their coat, you have to give it back. That would be a funny show, too. <laughs> <laughs> There's all kinds of shows that I thought would be interesting, but there'd be a very limited audience base because they wouldn't right. have the background to under to, right. to put it anywhere. It's, yeah, it, it, it'd be better off as a YouTube skit, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you start with this law first and then do a skit. Right, and then that. you do another law. Yeah. Yeah, right. and they're all parodies of modern TV shows. <laughs> yeah. Even asking, and just even just taking this verse, or just, I mean, lo looking at the, the before and after verses, now the ESV entitles this section "Miscellaneous Laws." Uh -huh. Well, mm -hmm. the problem Sun is, is that, laws. Yeah. Is that you know, the section begins with "guy newly married." Dot dot dot. And the next verse is, "No one shall take a mill or an upper millstone in pledge." I've uh, got that yes. word collateral. Here. Yeah, that's the same one. Then yeah. take care for leprosy. Then when you make your neighbor alone, dot 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 dot. And you should not oppress a hired worker. Father should not be put to death uh, because of their children. I mean, what is what is the flow of what it is that scripture is saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's bringing out a number of aspects. And you can't just simply say, I've got a proof text. No, I've got a, a teaching. I've got a, a series of thoughts and reflections so as to then say, I, he has to have something to wear at night because obviously in, in a mm -hmm. desert place, when, it's, when the sun goes down, the temperature goes way down. Okay, they need that to keep warm and keep alive. Whereas the guy who loses his, the millstone or the upper millstone, he can't grind. He can't right? work. So to he pay can't do it all. Work. Anything. I mean, you know, right. if you can't take that away, that's got to stay there. But that's a pledge. But so right. if he doesn't pay you back, you can take his business. And now you're also then probably going to end up enslaving him because you still you still 
right. in order for him to get it back, he's going to have to, in a sense, trade his life for it because it is his life. Mm -hmm. That's how he's, he's going to live. And these other passages then give us things to ponder. Well, how how does this all fit? If this if the scripture is, in a sense, one complete story, how do all the pieces of the story? Whereas we get hung mm -hmm. up on the well, you say this verse. Well, what about before and after? And usually, a context fills out more fully what is going on. If we were to also spend time on that, we would see more things as to how to understand the concept of pledge, how to understand the concept of the poor, the neighbor, things like that. And that would help to flesh out right. more of what the, you know, the, the theonomic view of the law is. Now it's a matter of coming in and exacting you know, retribution on everybody who fails to have their money into you on the first of the month. No, you've got okay. Well, what is the situation? You know, you're not you're not there to to humiliate them or annihilate them, but you know you are there to make them learn responsibility. You know the law's tutoring uh, function is there. So the, you know those are further things to think about. As as it's not just the verses, but it's also the flow. Why why, why is it that Moses? Why, as he's giving these long sermons, does he have all these series of things? Obviously, the people then could begin to think, well, okay, I've got to keep these things in mind, too. I can't just they're, say These I'm, are all related. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. Even though they don't appear to be. Yeah, to us, they, they don't because, again, we've got that the civil law. Is it moral law? Is it judicial law? Well, no, it's not quite that way. It's how but, you treat people. Yeah, it's not how can I parse this out so as I can get it out of my way so I'm not, respond, not under its sway any longer, right. but how can I now understand it, obviously in the light of Christ and in the light of the work of the Spirit now in the church, which is now a, in a sense a transnational kind of thing. That was something that we were talking about just before you got here, which is like, why? yeah, the heading for this section is sundry laws, like mm -hmm. miscellaneous things. Right. And I was pondering, John, Jonathan and I were pondering some stuff, like, is that because they wouldn't people necessarily wouldn't have had their own full copy of of the laws they would have only had like if they're going to listen to it being read publicly right. they might have been able to take some notes of things so that way they've got a variety of stuff on a single page given at one time to allow them to sort of wrestle with these and like put these puzzle pieces together right and get the bigger picture like he was saying mm -hmm. yeah. yeah versus god didn't start an exodus was like all right here's everything related to murder Right. No, well, they're sprinkled throughout yeah. five books. He doesn't write books. an encyclopedia article right. on it, where he brings together everything into one spot. No, it's kind of listening. I mean, obviously, every mm -hmm. every Sabbath day, listening in the synagogue, you know, the Levites in every time in every city. You know, also, then you're going out to you know, other people and bringing the law to them. But then it's what they learn, so it's a, a central thing working out, and then the people hearing every Lord's Day, every Sabbath day, hearing about it, and then every the, the festivals, hearing large amounts of scripture being read. I mean, obviously Ezra you know, do, doing all kinds of stuff, and then also then the priests also giving the sense. Not only mm -hmm. did they just read it, but they said, well, and the, and the point is that this, you know, here here's a quick summary of what he's been talking about for the last 20 minutes. And then going from there, however that particular thing needs to work out. But you know, realizing you need the whole thing, and then you also need summaries and you know, sh you know little things along the way to keep your place. Because you can't keep all 30,000 verses in your mind at the same time, but you can probably keep 50 summaries of you know, things. I mean, or just keeping, what is each book about? I mean, as, as you go into the Bible, yeah, you know, like the key verse orientation, or what is the key theme? I mean, that's no doubt that's how the Levites worked to some degree. It was just boiling it down to this is the basic point, and then as you hear it more fully, you'll see as you hear it read, you'll hear it more fully. As you know, every Sabbath, someone reads from the temple scrolls, or the scrolls in each of the synagogues, as they you know because they work their way seriatim through each of the scrolls, mm -hmm. or well, depending on whatever someone chose in some cases. Yeah, it's like, I, I think of it, you know, when you're watching a movie, mm -hmm. it, it flows. One thing, scene flows into the next, and they might not have anything to do with each other other than they're just, this scene comes right after. Mm -hmm. And right. topically, they might have nothing to do with each other. Right. But it's like, there's a sense in which it's more fun to learn things like that. Right. Some of the, some of the best movies, right, there'll be scenes of people who haven't even seen each other yet 
and it doesn't come together till the end, mm -hmm. right? They don't even meet each other till later in. Um, and well, so it's like it's, how a kid would learn something. Hmm. You don't give them you don't give them a book to to like start working through. It's like no, you give him a toy, you give him a Rubik's yep. cube, and let him start figuring it out. And yet, when he encounters a problem, there's a book or an instruction manual or something that he can refer to. I know people that will build Legos and they don't want to look at the manual mm -hmm. until they figure out, oh, I can't do this. Maybe I better, I better hmm. open up the book. It's a much more human, organic way to learn things is to like let your brain have fun. Don't focus mm -hmm. on one thing so long. Focus on sometimes the things around it when you're building a puzzle. If you're, you're stuck here and you get bored working on this one corner, you know, switch to the other side and try to look for these other color pieces and put them together. It's like whatever, however you want to do it, piecemeal it together, do it at your own pace. I can get kind of overwhelmed too when people talk about investing and like what's the best strategy and, and how often should I be looking to, to buy or sell? Do I just buy and hold for five years and then sell? Or do I take a 30-year look at it? You or know, do you sell I, the options? Or am I a day trader where I'm buying and selling a single stock 30, 40, 50 times in a day as it just goes up by pennies? You know, right. you just get a high enough volume of trades right. so you ride every wave. There's one psalm that for me clinches it, which is in one sense, it's it's the best invest in, investment, but it's also the longest term because it keeps going after you're dead. It's Proverbs, oh, it's Proverb, uh, Proverbs 19, 17. Go. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. I would think that the best person to lend to would be to God. I think he pays the best interest. I don't think anybody right. would argue with that. Yeah. So it's like if you really want to simple simplify all the borrowing and lending stuff down to, okay, here's all the stuff not to do. Okay, great. The law is great for that type of thing. It puts all right. sorts of limits on us. Yeah. But then, okay, that's great to know all the wrong directions not to go, but what's the direction I should go? And it really all, I think, is kind of summed up with this. Being generous to the poor is lending to the Lord. So really, hopefully the people who are poorest in spirit would be other believers. So if we lend to them or give to them without expecting anything in return, ironically, you know, it's sort of the counterintuitive thing with the law. The more you try to obey it, the more freedom you find. The more you try to cast it off yourself, the tighter it sticks to you. It, this is the same way. It's like the more free you are without expecting stuff in return, actually, the more you get back. Right. Uh, you mentioned poor in spirit. How do you interpret that? I got hired f to make uh, YouTube videos for a company a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and the guy who hired me was like incredibly wealthy. Mm -hmm. But when I went to talk to him, he was needy. <laughs> okay. He needed my help, even though he was rich. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was a really good example of like, why is this person rich? Why has he been made wealthy? It's because he's made himself poor on behalf of his clients. And in order for him to serve his clients better, he needs help from me. I can fill this void that he mm -hmm. has. And so you can be physically incredibly wealthy and be poor in spirit. And the poor in spirit, I think, right. is supposed to generate, like you mentioned before, blo things blossoming. You got right. a foundation so, laid a long time ago, and then it finally comes to fruition. The so poor I in spirit part will eventually blossom into actual wealth, right. eventually. Sure. So yeah, I would agree poor in spirit can be a rich person or a poor person. Um, and it's really their uh, a, a spiritual humility. It's the inside, yeah. Thing. So when you, when you said whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, I don't interpret that as whoever is generous to the poor in spirit lends to the Lord. I would say it's both. You think so? I would say okay. more, more so, hopefully, the inside and outside right. match. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, or, in a sense, you don't want them to be poor. Right. Um. <laughs> but, like, the Lord is the one who looks on the heart. Yes. And there are people, like, they don't, 
there's oftentimes where they don't match. Somebody right. can be physically poor and be very prideful in his spirit, and that right. might be part of the cause of him being poor. Sure. Other people can be uh, very poor in spirit and also very poor or very rich. Mm -hmm. And then also the prideful can also be very rich. Yes. And so obviously we want to look on the outside, and I would say the outside that this verse is talking to is definitely true. Right. And if we're talking about the inside, the poor in spirit, I would say that's even more true. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think that this is saying whoever is generous to the poor means means physically, financially poor, and that it ties into the New Testament verses of giving to the poor, or I guess just giving to anyone without expecting it back. There's a New Testament verse that says, like, do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. Isn't that Galatians 6? Galatians 6, yeah. Okay. As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So yeah, I would say, obviously, the Proverbs 19.17 is true here, and especially true of those who are poor in spirit as well. Right, to, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's definitely true at a surface level, because this is talking about the surface yes. level. Yes, yeah. But, yeah, also... Is Dave Ramsey's favorite verse, the rich, not his favorite, but maybe most often quoted, uh -huh. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Yeah. Well, pairing that up with Proverbs 19, 17, it's if you want to, in one sense, make God your slave to work for you, give to the poor. Right. Because well, you're lending yeah. to him. If you want to be, <laughs> this, it's, right. put these two together. Yeah. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave of the lender. So if I'm lending to God. And obviously, it's the type of thing that, what were you saying earlier, where the gospel is like, never mind, I lost it. Well, the gospel being like us being slaves of God. Mm -hmm. Is that what you? No, no, no. Where, where. Sometimes it's, it seems like it's the opposite is the case, right? Where counterintuitive. Counterintuitive. Yeah, counterintuitive. That's what I was saying. It's right. Like, um, one of those counterintuitive verses where the, the first become last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when Paul's sharing, or I guess he's teaching on Mars Hill, trying to give them who don't know who God is, he's trying to give them like the very basics of who God is. God tells us to do these things and it's not as if God needs anything. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't need our service. He doesn't need us to eat for us to give him sacrifices of meat and try to right. keep him alive. Right. That's not why he asks us to, to serve him. He doesn't need us. Well, that, that one's actually interesting. Scroll up again. Uh, be not one of those who give pledges, who put up security for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from under you? So what we saw in the law was you can put up security for your debts. Like, it is lawful, but this now in Proverbs says it's not wise. Right. It's definitely not wise. It also sounds like somebody who said who keeps using the same thing in order to secure multiple accounts and multiple. Oh, things. okay. This okay. relates to something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, than, interesting. Yeah, don't be giving pledges. Don't take one item and use it. Go around to five different people in the community to say because then they need to come to your house. As long as you make sure that all five of them don't show up at the same time, they'll all think <laughs> that you, they still got the pledge for you. But now. <laughs> This is really interesting. I remember you saying this when we were at, uh, on on the couch at the parish group. Um, the The American economy is so built on debt. Right. You know. Yeah. What is it? When a bank lends out money, or no, it's when you deposit money at a bank, mm -hmm. they lend it immediately, like, so right. it's not there. Right. And then that bank takes that money that they and they lend it again. So it's all tied up. Oh. So when you pull out, you know, ten thousand dollars. This loan's got to be paid. This loan's got to be paid. This loan's got to be paid. And so there's all this money that's that's been borrowed over multiple times. Right. It's not only that, but they're allowed to, if they have 
their account is a million dollars or whatever, right? They're allowed to loan out 10 times that amount. I believe it's still 10. It's more I, than a million, which re- is really no, all this is I talking remember about. Hearing, yeah. I remember hearing North that it's gone like up that. and down <laughs> a few times over yeah. the years, oh, yeah. but I believe it's still 10. It might have oh, been boy. bumped up higher yeah. since 2008 when they cut it down to 10, I think. Yeah, fractional reserve banking yep. is the idea of that. And this verse is saying, it's Don't not saying that. it's unlawful. Right. Like, this is a problem, well, but it's a really foolish thing to do. Yep. Well, oh, no, I, no. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, because isn't that what this is talking about? This, this is, is it? I thought it was just generally don't give pledges for your debts because you'll probably you're you're liable to lose those pledges, and that's foolish. I I think that pledging multiple <laughs> multiple times that could be a sin. Um, I don't know. I guess technically they're accounting for it in a sense. It's all legal, right? But. Ugh. How was I thinking that this was related? I don't know. I had a, th- I, I had a thought that linked the two, and that's gone now. There's a level where you can where you can multiply risks and do stuff like that, and it so, was not a sin. But I think that the fact that they're tied in so t- so tightly with the actual creation of money, I don't know. It makes it really crooked. I had I had another thought on that that might be. A counterpoint to that, but I'll get okay. to that. So it's when it's saying, "Don't be the one who gives pledges, who puts up security for debts." What's the alternative to that? Borrowing money that doesn't require a pledge, um, or is it just saying not to go and being in debt is not a good idea? I, yeah, I think it means oh, you 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 give a pledge for this money rather than that. An alternative could be. Find another income source, right? Find an uh, give the person part ownership of yes. your business or whatever. Right, 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 right. Find find another way to or because this, this strikes if me you're as, going into debt for something foolish like a new car. Don't 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 give up your house. You know, take a reverse mortgage on your house to buy a Lamborghini, right? Well, that's how I was thinking it was related. So it was one of the things that you said was. Like the way to, even when somebody has a piece of property paid off, uh-huh. they'll borrow against it in order to get a loan. Like that's how that's how common and pervasive uh, yes. getting a loan is. Right. It's just a standard American practice for you to have negative in savings. Right. That's the the average per person. Right. And again, it the system incentivizes that because right. of inflation. And and also because borrowing money, you you don't pay taxes on money you borrow. Yes, that's right. And so it's like you got every you got the government every which way trying to encourage people to borrow as much money as possible, even against things that you are not in debt on. Right. It makes financial business sense to do it that way. Right. To to have no income, and instead borrow money to live off of. That's how the rich don't pay tax. Right. Yeah, and that's what this is saying. But it's like it seems so counterintuitive because you because if you were to actually take this to heart and start to think of borrowing against your own assets as a bad idea, all of a sudden people would have to start paying more money in taxes. So it's like there's something that says to me that there's a lot more going on beneath the surface. You if just take this all by itself, it would seem really stupid. But it's like you got to take the whole system. Right. The whole system. Yeah. If the system's broken, it makes some wise things seem foolish, even though they aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, It would make it look foolish. But that's because we're viewing it from a crooked system. Yeah. It's like when I brought up to that one guy, it's like this, uh, the believer that you borrowed from, he's not charging you interest, is he? Well, and when it turned out that he was... I, I literally got hit with like six other things that these people said. Well, if the, that, then, that, then how? Yeah. But the, but, 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 and it just and it's like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, we're wrong in it's a lot of things. Wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not just this one little point. It's like that. There's a beauty to that about God's law. You start to keep one point, and it's like you plug the the dam is about to collapse. There's a fifty thousand leaks. Yeah, when you plug this leak, all of these are going to start to leak a little bit more. That doesn't mean that you should take your hand off of this one. 
it means you need to plug all the leaks. Proverbs 28, 8, whoever multiplies his wealth by interest and profit gathers it for him who is generous to the poor. That's another sort of a clincher for me. It's like, I don't know all this stuff. Right. These bankers that know deal with all these reverse mortgages and how to do refractional reserve, fractional reserve banking. They got all these people they're lending it out to and they have all these business statistics and they're crunching all the numbers. And I'm just like, I know none of that stuff. Like my money's just dissolving out of my fingers. I don't know how that's happening. Everybody's in debt to everybody else. And, right. But it's like, okay, here's a linchpin thing for you. That's it's like, yeah. if you want to, all those bankers that are crunching all these numbers, here's how to make all of them work for you to where they're gathering up money to give it to you. It's right. be generous to the poor. Yeah, that's really encouraging. It's a real simple solution. Go to, go to a jail <laughs> and start talking to people. Uh, I had a guy call me yesterday morning, and he's like, Hey, Adam, um, I need to pay the fee for my uh, ankle, uh, ankle bracelet. My anklet that like tracks my location <laughs> and all that stuff. Okay. Can you call this number and give them your credit card? I need you to give me $85 to pay for that or else I, I'm not sure how that works. Like apparently it was either going to shut off and he would be in trouble because they wouldn't know where he was or so, right. something like that. So I have to look into that. Like why? Yeah. Make sure that's why you have to pay for your own. I never thing. mentioned that on TV. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, it might just be part of an accountability thing. Like they got to make sure you've got some income or you've got some, somebody out there is holding you accountable for something. And I'm just like, what an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. That was literally what I thought when he asked uh. me. Because, I mean, that's what keeps, uh, that's the dangerous thing about democracy, right, that the Founding Fathers talked about. People can figure out that they can vote themselves large yes. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they can vote themselves favorable tax statuses and all this stuff, and now all right. of a sudden they're in this vicious cycle. They'll vote for whoever is going to give them the most free stuff. Well, isn't the church supposed to be the one out there with the most handouts for the poor? So right. we get all their votes. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they say, oh, hey, these people are giving me more than that. Maybe they know justice a little bit better. I think that's a strategy God wants us to use. Because uh, America's using it to pretty good effect right now. Trying to get more people on welfare. That's how you buy your voter base. Right. Or let them come across the border. Mm-hmm. The difference for us, though, is that we actually teach people to be self-sustaining instead of a perpetual slaves. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. Ezekiel 18, 5 through 17. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend it interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord. And then the opposite. It basically, and it repeats that again. Well, no, it's the, it's the inverse, right? It says... Uh, he, he who does not restore the pledge and he who um, does take interest in the lower part shall not surely, uh, his oh, blood shall yeah. be upon himself. If he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest and takes profit, Shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. Does not defile his neighbor's wife. Does not oppress anyone. Exacts no pledge. Commits no robbery but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from iniquity, takes no interest or profit, obeys my rules and walks in my statutes. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. 
I think that's the situation that we're in mm -hmm. to a large extent. I'm so thankful for my dad pointing me in this direction and just the nature of the father-son thing is that your kids take things further than you did. They, they outlive you, they, they continue on and they have kids and they do the same. My dad was, he was raised in public school and was not taught a lot of stuff. I think he, he got saved by a ministry, a Bible, like through the mail study hmm. from a ministry in California of all places. And while he was in Texas, hmm. going to a church that didn't teach the Bible. Hmm. And he got saved in his physical church building in spite of all hmm. of the things his church had never taught him. When he was in his teens, late teens, he tells one story about uh, going to a Bible study and somebody, like, this is, this is how much of a failure his church had, had been in teaching him. Somebody mentioned the second coming of Jesus. And my dad said, the second coming of Jesus, where is that in the Bible? <laughs> mm -hmm. That was how ignorant he was in his early college years. But he grew up his, in church his whole life mm -hmm. and repeat that times 100 million people, I think. And that's where you get to where America is. You get all these people, they think, by going to a certain building on a certain day of the week and listening to somebody talk about something that's completely irrelevant <laughs> and doesn't help people apply it to their current situations it can make them think that they're, they've got some brownie points somehow. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, Jonathan, with you go to the New Testament and Jesus like kicks everything up a notch. Mm -hmm. Jesus points to unbelievers. Uh, where is that? Luke 6, 34 and 35. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Whatever unbelievers, whatever sinners are doing, at the very least, you have to outdo them. You can't go below what they're doing. <clears throat> for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That's, that's a phrase right there. Yep. There's one story in Nehemiah. I was trying to put the pieces of this together. Uh, so you had Ezra bringing the people back to the land after captivity. And then you had Nehemiah bring another, a second wave of people. And they're the ones that, they built the wall under Nehemiah. So these people are coming back. And I think the people that were already there were still having to pay taxes to Babylon. Is that right? Could be. And so they couldn't quite, it was difficult for them to pay those taxes. So they had to mortgage all their land that they had returned to, and they were selling their, their sons and daughters into slavery. They're getting pretty close to rock bottom. Again, after like, yay, we're coming back to the promised land. Oh, great, right. we're enslaved. So now you got this second wave of people come in. Nehemiah comes back to these people and says, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. Oh, there's a famine too, not just taxes. Right. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it's not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Then I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials, and I said to them, You are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. So you've got 
Nehemiah and his people who are buying Jews off the slave market to help mm -hmm. give them their freedom and return them to the land. And then he gets back to the land, and where have all of these Jews been being sold into the market from? Right. From Israel. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's Jews who are selling them. So you, you, got, you got the nation of Israel working against itself. You got these people pulling people out of, out of drowning from the river, and you, got, you get back home, and your brothers are throwing people into the river that you're then having to pull them out. So he finally makes that connection. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. And they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests, and I made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they promised. I feel like that's kind of the current situation of the church. Yes. Yeah. And and what's remarkable, incredible about this is they said, yeah, yeah, we'll fix it. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and they did. Yep. I presented a, a book that I'm working on to one of the elders at, at church. And to my surprise, he really liked it. And it was the message of, like, why don't we have our own systems for dealing with certain things in the church? Like, we're supposed to be the ones, ideally, that unbelievers come to mm -hmm. for their difficult cases. Right. And we're, not only can we not solve our disagreements in our own house, we're going to unbelievers and asking them to, like, it's completely flipped. Right. Why, why don't we have our own system for dealing with these things? I think it's 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 where Paul says, we're going to judge angels. Mm -hmm. We're going to judge heavenly cases. Why are, why are we not able to settle earthly matters? If we're a priest, the priest of the believer, like if there's a case that's too difficult, you take it to the priests. You appeal to them for their for a final ruling. That's supposed to be our ideal. That's what's prophesied about the new covenant. Isaiah 2, Micah 4, Daniel 2. So like the people will come to the city of the Lord and his his word will go out to them mm -hmm. that they may hear his judgments. Well, that's supposed to be through us. Isaiah 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Gentile shall not lift up sword against Gentile, neither shall they learn war any more. Well, who's supposed to teach them all that? Supposed to come to us, but like we can't get our own act together. Right. I think that's probably what, sto what sowed those initial seeds of being taken off the gold standard. Every new wave of oppression from the government is always, well, we got to do it for, for safety or we got to do this mm -hmm. for the poor or the people that can't work or whatever. But it's like if the church was already doing a good job taking responsibility for all those things, yes. none of those new programs would fly. Right. Because there's no need. Right. And the ones that they didn't do quickly, rapidly, they just crept into, like the hospitals, uh, is a similar thing. The church ran the hospitals since hospital, like they invented hospitals mm. and they've ran them 
up until really quite recently when the government started taking over and, you know, with the promise of doing a better job and being more fair. But what's interesting is the church was doing that and, it, and they were doing a good job of it for a long, long time. The church was doing such a good job that maybe the government got jealous hmm. and power hungry. In so many places, the church just folded. And I think there's still a few, maybe like Lutheran hospitals, and I know there are Catholic hospitals still uh, holding out. Yeah, St. Mary's. <laughs> but, um, but that's about it, <laughs> you know? Like there's a, there's, there's a few Protestant ones holding out, but not many. And even then, it's so, I guess what I was trying to say is it's so blended now with the government subsidies and aids and this and that and the other thing that it's only barely it's kind of church in name only you know mm -hmm. it's like it's barely the realm of the church it's it's mostly the government providing it at it's this point easy to get discouraged at like how much ground has been lost or taken over by unbelievers uh -huh. there's one highlight i can think of my dad sells insurance and so this was actually kind of a big deal in our family when the Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act came out and mandated people mm -hmm. to get health insurance or pay extra taxes. There was a there was a carve out in that mandate for for religious health care cost sharing services. Yes. Mm -hmm. So things like MediShare, so it had already been taking a really doing a really good job right. being responsible of believers sharing with one another and lending without expecting to receive anything in return, essentially. Right. Oh, your your son has leukemia. Here's money. Right here, you don't don't have to pay us anything. I hope There's he gets no, better. There, there. Like I'm in Samaritans, right? And so I do I do have an expectation for someone to pay, but it's not a legal expectation, right? right? right. It's a yeah. I mean, I assume people take. Care I take of care me. of you. You would take care of me. Um, like, but it's not le They aren't legally bound at, in any way to to pay. And and you're right. That that is an amazing step forward in in that so, realm yeah a congressman like when they were trying to they were putting all this stuff together like nobody's actually read the full bill they're like oh well maybe they won't read our stuff either right. <laughs> essentially was the thinking <laughs> but they so they got that put in there to where you're not paying extra in taxes because christians were being were taking responsibility and doing a good job of it right so that we don't the judgment doesn't hit us, <laughs> right? Right. We 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 know that the, these people are being responsible. I mean, right. It, yeah. people, so all their thing of like, well, we got to make sure people are safe and their healthcare expenses. Right. Well, it's that already doesn't fly. Right. That reason for forcing it on people doesn't fly because yeah, they're already doing a better job of it. Yeah. Than what you're proposing. No, that's great. Yeah. And so, I didn't pay any, and that made a lot of people realize, oh. Yeah. I don't want to pay extra in taxes and this is a whole lot more affordable than the, you know, $900 a month. Now it's only going to be 100 or 200. Right. Even though there's no legal obligation for them to pay, they've also never not paid. Right. So, they got a pretty good track right. record. You're not going to show up at the hospital or the emergency room and run up a great big bill because you've not been responsible. You've already I mean, whether it's Samaritan or some of the other where you do have a regular monthly amount that you are you obligate yourself to pay, right? And then whatever you, whatever needs you have, you send them in. And after, I mean, you have to figure out how to deal with the upfront costs. Yep. But then you know that it's going to others are going to be giving you money to help deal with those things. And this was this was quite a few years ago. There was one month where my finances were really tight, mm -hmm. and I called them and I said, "Hey, can you guys?" Yeah, I was assuming for mm -hmm. them to treat it like a like an insurance plan, essentially, because right. that's what it's basically used in right. place of. But I said, can you drop me as a member for one month just so that I can make ends meet, and then I'll pick back up the next month? And they said, no, we just won't charge you this month, but you'll still be a member. But you were willing to reach out to them. Right. right. Yeah, it's, it's the problem is when people don't, when they just simply, like, well, they should come and tell, ask me if I can <laughs> not pay this month. No, 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 you're, you should be responsible. A person at least is going to say, hey, I won't be able to. Now, whether it's opting out for a month or just saying, okay, you know, but you, you've come with, to them mm -hmm. and, and sought their, their, you know, for them to say yes or no to this. 
mean, they can say no. I mean, there's not much that they can do about it, but they can say, well, yeah, we can, or well, we may have to refigure this out, or say, it's like when people borrow from the church, they always ask, do we have to pay it back? No. <laughs> but people are so into the, well, if I'm going to have to pay you back, then I'm just going to be in the same position I already am in. But no, the idea is that this is a this is a gift. And you don't, you know, there's no reciprocity. I mean, there's the reciprocity of your part of the body. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as, as God <clears throat> you know, increases you, then you should be giving back for it. But it's, you don't do it to... You're not doing it to repay this. You're doing this to help another person. Mm -hmm. right. it's, it's not. It's not a quid pro quo kind of system. It's right. A, you're give, They're giving to you. You're giving to them, and God is using it for His glory. God's giving us something out of nothing. It's like, right. it's like I, I think of the story of the ever flowing jar of oil when Elisha helped the widow. It's like, well, when you take this jar and you, he poured it into another jar, that jar was didn't have a lack of oil. It still was completely full, and he could right. fill up another jar. It's like God's the same way. When he gives us something, yeah, power goes out of him, like the, the woman who had the flow of blood that touched Jesus' robe. Right. Yeah, power went out of him, but it's not like he was weakened right. by that. He still has as much as he ever did. And what's, what's really interesting is we can see it working out through history. We can see... The growth of the, prosperity. The growth of prosperity and technology and Isaac Newton and all these other people who advanced science and technology and knowledge and the amount of just raw wealth, right, that's been created through all of that is amazing. And yet we still doubt sometimes God's ability to grow, <laughs> right? No, he is infinite. There's always more. Right. And and we're living here on earth, right, with these physical realities and these true hardships that we do go through. And even so, we're seeing this crazy amount of growth. And the other thing, if, if we go back a little bit in the conversation to where you were saying, it is kind of discouraging to see what the church has given up and lost. It can be. But it should also be really encouraging because the church has done it before. We can do it again, mm -hmm. right? We can do it so much easier now that we can look. Yeah, they made hospitals. I guess we can do that. When they made hospitals, no, there but was they no didn't have anybody thing. to look they to. They didn't even know the, the basics of you know human anatomy. Like that stuff is kind of crazy how, how the body works. And they had to do a lot of trial and error to figure stuff out. That would have been hard. We have it so much to easier look back now. Towards. Yeah. So much easier. We got a lot more shoulders to stand on. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because now that they've taken away the the insurance mandate mm -hmm. under Trump, yeah. it's not a requirement anymore. Right. But I've stayed with MediShare. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have to. Like I could completely drop that and be uninsured, have no MediShare, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I don't plan on ever taking it. I don't need, I've never had any medical expenses, but that's still, you know, it's like hundred, two hundred dollars that I've been paying every month for the last when was Obamacare? Two thousand nine? Something like that. Thir thirteen years I've been paying a couple hundred dollars a month and never gotten anything for it. But it changed my thinking. Like I I'm right. happy to do this. Yeah, I know. I would not be happy to write a check to an insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I am happy to to pay to other members of mm -hmm. Samaritan. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. We're kind of getting a little bit off topic here. But yeah. <laughs> the difference between uh, MediShare and Samaritan, MediShare has a, a PPO. So when you take it to a hospital to pay for something, to them, it looks like insurance. Nice. They're not worried about it and feeling like they're not going to get paid. Okay. Like if you go into a hospital and they say, how are you going to pay for this? And you're going to say, well, I have a whole bunch of uh, friends all across the country and they're going to mail you checks. <laughs> right. The hospital's like, uh-huh. Really? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When services are rendered. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, Which is funny because they don't get the bill out yes. for months anyways. Yeah, well, like it well, takes them months to get the bill out. Yeah. Well, and they then do the a few months later they... Give you another bill for all oh, yeah. the other stuff they, they were doing. Oh, yeah. 
But that's that was one thing. That was a genius thing about like you could say, oh, yeah. everybody oh, just cool. use gold and silver, and everybody's like, I don't have like I don't have a place to store it. I don't have a safe in my house. I don't have yeah. Like if I, somebody was going to pay me in gold or silver, how do I test to make sure that it's real? That's the cool thing about Bitcoin is that it like already works. There's all right. this infrastructure yeah. already built. The internet's yep. already out there. Um, you can trade it in like. Uh, brokerage accounts right. and all that stuff. People built that infrastructure, so it really is just like, right. oh, I take a picture of a QR code with my phone, and that's like, cool. I've already got all the tools yeah. that I need. That's an extra bit of right. bonus. To and it's perfectly, adoption. perfectly divisible, and it could, get, you know, be as much high value as you want. Makes it really convenient. You don't have to lug around. Right. A bunch of weight. A lot of these verses are actually kind of repeating. I mean, there's not really a lot more. Yeah. It's like we pretty much yeah. covered everything, <clears throat> every aspect of what the Bible has to say about it. It's not right. really a complicated well, this subject. This is a new one. This is a new one. The wicked borrows but does not pay back. Um, That's kind of a play on the... Uh, well, it's the inverse because we've been talking about the lender the whole time for the most part. We haven't been talking about the person who's borrowing money nearly as much if you fit that into the new testament well right? it's, it's kind of a play on the ezekiel 18 passage from before where it says if a man is righteous yes. and then the evil man does this yes but i guess my my point is um in the new testament i should lend to you without expectation of you paying me back how much do you have in the bank right now <laughs> <laughs> um and yet you're going to be reading psalms and saying oh the wicked takes a loan and doesn't pay it back, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to pay it back, right? But I'm and I'm going to give without expectation of paying back. Yeah. So this is Psalm thirty-seven twenty-one through twenty-six. The wicked wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. So it's like, yeah, the yeah the wicked is wicked, but you also by not paying back, he's not robbing the righteous of his right. ability to continue lending and right. giving, right? For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Oh, I remember I wanted to say this after... What you said earlier, Dennis, you can forgive somebody without necessarily having to trust them. Hmm. If I was to be this this wicked guy who is intent on going around and borrowing, mm -hmm. you can forgive me that. Yes. That doesn't mean you're going to necessarily say, I'm, you, if next time you come and ask me, I'll give you more. Right. Yeah. If I do pay it back, which if it has truly been given to me, I don't have to. Mm -hmm. Right. But if I want to be able to borrow more in the future or do it again, mm -hmm. then I do want to pay it back yeah. so that it can be more than just an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. Your echo, you, you give something out and it comes back more. So well, then you can do it again with a bigger amount. And that's what all business is based off of. Trusting business sure. partnerships or relationships. It's you give this person a little, they turn it into a little bit more and then they give it back to you. And you turn that into a little bit more and you give it back to them and they, they increase it and you get, so it's just a constant, it's always going up in an upward direction forever. That's the definition of life is that it has to keep going. If it ever stops, if one person ever breaks the cycle, then it's all, it's all done. You have to start from the bottom again. So that's the impetus on the person who's borrowing to, you better be borrowing for a good reason and you better be responsible with what you're borrowing. Well, I guess that's probably the one thing we haven't touched on. Parable of the Talents. There's a couple versions of this. There's one in Luke. I think there's one in Matthew. Oh, it's Mark. Oh, and Matthew. The kingdom will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. So the master's lending these things to his servants and he lends to them according to their ability. If you're not very good with increasing what I've given you, then I'm not going to give you very much. Right. So it's like that's your encouragement to be faithful is that if you want more, you need to be more responsible. You need to be more skilled. Then he went his way. He who had received the five talents at once 
went and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents, for everyone who has more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Kind of hit me hard one time when somebody said, like, God only gives you what you can handle. Mm. <laughs> be thankful he doesn't give you more. Mm -hmm. and that was kind of a sobering thought. Maybe the reason that I haven't. I think the church should be farther along in this area or should have more responsibility. I think the church would have it if it was responsible enough. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 and that's kind of the that's a catch twenty two. Again, they we abandon a lot of our responsibilities. We abandon giving to the poor by saying, "Oh, the government can do it." Right? We abandon teaching, saying, "Oh, the government can do it." We not just weren't responsible; we just abandoned our responsibility. Mm -hmm. We rejected it. Yeah, yeah. The prime example in government is God telling. His people, you're supposed to pick elders and judges in all your cities to judge you. You're supposed to pick your own. And well, God says, "Can you pick a king like the other nations?" Yeah. Oh, that's later on, I guess. Well, well, no, well, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, the, yeah. there was a, an allowance in the law for Israel having a king. We're not going to go and figure out what we're supposed to do. <laughs> we, God, we want you to tell us how to go about doing this. God's like, I already told you, and you're not doing it. You're not taking responsibility to figure out, hmm. like, learn the law. Go and do it. Not you're you're asking me to enforce yeah. it on you right. without you having an understanding of it. Yeah, you're, you're not willing to take the time and effort and to find the person among you who is able to do these things. Mm -hmm. You know, we're putting together the system, the training, the growing in wisdom and knowledge and understanding so as to be able to be, you know, who are the people who've been making elders for the last century or two or more, well, what, that what came has grown at the, out of that? I mean, from what, Mo, what Moses did I mean, was kind of, you know, his father-in-law Jethro said, you can't deal with this all by yourself. You need to have, you have people who are over tens, hundreds, thousands. You need to have this graded system of, you know, of, of advice giving at minimum, if not courts themselves. And now that's obviously then going to then spread out further. But obviously right. Israel has not even move forward from there to realize that, okay, who is going to replace Moses? And you had a series of judges who kept Israel going, but then now, I mean, what does it mean when Samuel comes in and then the rest of me, what is the transition? I and mean, this gets back to that Buchanan forum a few months, I uh, think three months back where they're talking about the king and whether or not it was good or bad, you know, for what had happened. You know, what is the point of the kingship and you know, how is that going to be? Obviously, David is a better one, but still, there's a sense which God is telling Israel, well, okay, if you're going to ask me to do it, probably not going to be exactly what you want, but in order for you to learn from this, and then obviously it goes forward, goes forward from there, but there's just you know, that kind of thing that's got to, I've put all these things in place and you still won't learn from them. The tutelage I've been giving you, the tutor of the law, 
right. you're still not paying attention mm -hmm. to what I'm telling you. And you're, you're going to say, well, you've just got to pop this guy into us and we'll be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. we'll, have other, we'll have somebody out there who will tell us what to do. Yeah. And God's I've, like, I am telling you what to do. Right, <laughs> right. I've, I've always read that slightly differently mm -hmm. to the point where I wouldn't, it allows for a king because God knew that they would ask for a king and get a king, right? My understanding was the law set up basically a representative gover form of government rather than a kingship because God is the king of Israel, right? And so then in a story form, right, the people said, oh, we want a king like these other nations. We want a king, a human king like these other nations, right? And so God gives them a human king who has a son, has a son. I mean, I guess it's not all yeah, has a son, has a son, and then has a son, Jesus, right? Mm. And now it's like, oh, guess who's your king? God is, right? Mm. It's like, this is, we're back there again. You have the king, your king is Jesus. Therefore, your king is God. Why don't you try that uh, representational government we told you about back in the law? <laughs> so there's this Deuteronomy 17 passage. It says, Verse 14, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, uh -huh. you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Yeah. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to require many horses. Right. Okay, so maybe I was wrong there. First Samuel 8, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. So basically they're saying, Hey Samuel, yeah, we know God put, uh, we know you're God's prophet and God chose you and all this stuff, yep. but you didn't do a good job raising your sons, so we really don't trust you anymore. Right. Uh, we want a king. But the funny thing is that they're asking Samuel to appoint for them a king. Right. They're saying, hey, we don't trust you anymore. Can you choose somebody else? Right. Well, well, <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah. You've obviously done a bad job with your sons, who have not exactly been stellar, but we still trust you well, enough. We still trust you to pick somebody. Yeah. Right. Even, even though you haven't raised anybody up who we want to rule over us. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So yeah, how does that square with the Deuteronomy 17 passage? At first glance, I was thinking, I thought Deuteronomy 17 was saying, I will set a king over me. Like, we're going to choose our own king, which this law gives allowance for. But then it also says that the Lord will choose that king. Right, right, right. You right. may indeed yeah. set a king over yourself whom God will choose. Yeah, I still I still read that as maybe not exactly a positive endorsement of you should set a king over yourself. Well, it says you may. Right. It does say you may. Yeah. So they're just doing that here in 1 Samuel 8. Yeah. But what we do know is God says here you aren't going to like it. Well, maybe it's because they're asking Samuel instead of asking God directly. Maybe, but Samuel is the prophet. That is who they're supposed to ask, right? Mm. Um, so if you go back to the passage, it says the king shouldn't do this, right? Shouldn't do this things. And then... Well, but God when, was displeased right when they asked. Right. Not after Saul had obviously done all that stuff. Right, right. So they, they ask... And God says, oh, you realize what a king's going to do. He's going to do these things <laughs> that the law says not to do. Mm -hmm. he'll, he'll take your kids And the people to ignored war, that because Samuel ignored warned them, right. them and right. gave them a chance to like. Right. So, so I guess what, this, what this, this doesn't really change my view. It permits, it certainly permits a king. So they weren't sinning by taking a king and it's setting it up. It's really setting up the story for God to say, yeah, you can have a king. He's going to do this, though. Warning, it warning. Might have been just, it might have been the same sort of thing. Like, God didn't per permit divorce from the beginning. But yeah. because of the hardness of your hearts, right. exactly. Moses allowed you to do this. So that yes. might be in the same sort of category. I think it's 
in that vein, certainly, especially with the warnings. Like, the warnings are there, and then in the fullness of time, Jesus inherits the kingship. And it goes straight back to God. God's the king. And we can have our governments, because there are other places about how the government s system works. Because let's be honest, the king isn't really a governmental system. He still has to do what the law says. He doesn't <laughs> get mean, to legislate he's things. He's kind of, he's kind of, it, he, it's weird. In Israel, right, he kind of takes over everything. Solomon becomes the judge, the top judge. But it's a weird fit. Um, like the people obviously didn't have the best discernment about all this stuff. And it, right. there's a, it says this phrase a few, several times throughout the whole passage. Uh, and the thing that the king did pleased the people just as everything the king did pleased the people. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like the people don't know what to think. They don't have discernment. So they're like, right. the king's my guy. I look to him. Right. Whatever exactly. he does, exactly. I love whatever he does, no matter what it right. is. Even Whereas if it's killing people. They're supposed to be electing leaders among the tens and the hundreds and the thousands, right? And they're be, supposed to have judges in all their cities. Being more involved. Yeah. And elders in all the gates. Right. Right. And they didn't do that. Yeah. So exactly. it could be So they they again they abandoned their responsibility or rejected their responsibility to be involved in the government and say, ah, oh, just give us a king. That way we don't have to bother with that it. That way we won't have to think about what to do. Yeah, we're just we'll told just we're just to be told. Well, and God's I'll like, I pulled you out. Of, I pulled you out of Egypt because no. you guys said you hated that. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Also, so, yeah. Yeah, you also have to consider at the end of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, which is kind of the setup for mm -hmm. Samuel. Yes. You know, so, I mean, I think there was always going to be a king. I think that was God's thing. Because, and as I argued at the Buchanan Forum, Melchizedek. He's king of Salem. There, he, he, he is king of peace. To Christ, king of priests. He is. He's all these. Wait a minute. A king was also a priest and also functions as a prophet because he's over. He's ahead of Levi because of, of through Abraham and things like. That. I mean, all the things that Hebrews does with that. It's kind of kingliness was always part of it. It's always been an aspect of, mm -hmm. of the prophet, priest, and king. So obviously this has some point. I mean, you have the judges going, doing, you know, bringing judgment, bringing uh, salvation to Israel, but then they fall away. Well, at the end, it says, it leaves with the last note is, there was no king. Obviously, this is being written after the mm -hmm. fact. So this leads in, then into Samuel, and then, you know, Samuel became old. He was made his son's judges. They're failing as judges. Right. So there is the call. Israel yes. knows it needs a king. Mm -hmm. But it also is not owning up to the fact that it's rejected God, which means right. it's also rejected Jesus. So it's it's rejected what should have been, in a sense, an appeal to what would become the Melchizedekian side or or David. I mean, David and Melchizedek, you kind of com compare them um, or at least parallel them and say the, these are the things that were always supposed to be, but you're not coming about it in the right spirit. You're not coming about it in the right way. And so now you're going to have to go through all this stuff. And obviously David's going to be the one that they needed. And yet he fails again. Again, Solomon comes in. He brings, you know, some of the greatest. But then he also then gets foreign wives and all these. And then it all splits after that. So it's always, the human king is always going to be a failure. Mm -hmm. But he's always moving forward to Jesus right. himself, up until Jesus, king. who is, yeah. and he's also a human king. Yes, I do have all power at mm -hmm. the end of Matthew right. 28. You know, he's, you know, like, like Cyrus was over, was you know, the, the Messiah for Israel, so Christ is now Messiah for the world. And I have all authority over everything, everybody, all the time. You know, and that's the whole, you know, it's, it's bringing it to fruition, but now it's also got to be fulfilled or executed, played out throughout the course of, you know, the centuries that will follow. There's several things like that where God uses even Israel or Solomon or David in their failures. Mm -hmm. God is using and incorporating their sinful actions, showing how he's actually, in one sense, able to do those things in righteousness right. or redeem them. Like Solomon, 
he obviously did acquire great wealth for mm -hmm. himself. Well, obviously God gave it to him, right. but Solomon hung on to it, I think. Uh, and that was part of his thing. Obviously he had wives. He, he was not supposed to do that. That's a prohibition for king not to have many wives. Mm -hmm. um, he had 300 wives and 700 concubines, <laughs> essentially. Concubines are a type of wife. Right. But um, yeah, so he's got a thousand wives. Well, in one sense, that's Solomon is the picture where all the surrounding nations are hearing of his wisdom and being drawn to Solomon, mm -hmm. like with the Queen of Sheba. Like, they told me you were wise, and they tried to tell me, but they didn't tell me the half of it. It's greater than I thought. And you've got all these Gentiles that are just like, oh, Solomon's wonderful. We love mm -hmm. Solomon. We'll come and ask him, and he gives us gifts and all these. Like, that's Shalomon, king of peace, mm -hmm. is literally what Solomon's, what Solomon's name means. Obviously, Solomon was not supposed to have a bunch of wives. Right. But God uses that picture to where the gospel does go out to the Gentiles, and now you've got a whole bunch of nations being brought into one king. Mm -hmm. That's Solomon. Uh, Solomon even used, in the construction of the temple, Solomon used slave labor from the nations to build it. Well, that's how the true temple is being built, by non-Jewish slave labor to Christ. And even with David, there's a lot of stuff, hairy stuff in there with like having multiple wives. So David had like seven or eight wives. Even before he was king, he had already already had multiple. But it's like, yeah, obviously, if a king wants to try and expand his power, it's allying with other nations by taking all their daughters as wives and stuff. Well, God does that, but he does it in a righteous way. There are limits on what we can do versus what, what God can do, because God can take multiple people from all the different nations and knit them into one body. I think the first time I had ever thought about the allowance for the king in Deuteronomy 17 mm -hmm. versus the first Samuel 8, I think the first time I ever heard somebody preach on that was like, they were allowed to have a king and they could have asked for a king in a righteous way, but they were asking in with a bad, sure. a sinful motivation, which is what sure. made it bad. And I think that there's merit to that. There's merit. Yeah. As well. I don't think it's clear that we're told one way or another, like in this Deuteronomy 17 passage. I feel like, though, if they had asked in a righteous way with a good attitude. According to this law. Then God, then God probably still would have given them the same warnings because it's still human beings that we're dealing with. And human beings becoming kings are going to have those same temptations. Yeah, and I think the lesson is clear that just because you ask me for a different type of ruler, it's not going to solve. It's a heart problem right. with you guys. Exactly. It's not that you don't have the right form of government, and if you could just right. get the right guy this time, it's really all about, no, this is your responsibility to do these things I told you to do. Right. And your problem is that it's, it's with your heart, which is the whole lesson of the Old Testament, is that God can give us all every opportunity to do the right thing, and we're never going right. to do it. Well, in a sense, will. asking for a king is a lot like asking for a law, right? It's in a sense it's like, oh, just 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 tell us what to do. That'll be good enough. Make it just make us all do just this. Just make stuff. us a list. We'll we'll yeah. Um and but but God preempts that, right? In in the Old Testament, he preempts that by giving us a law as an example. Hey, this is what it would look like. So don't even bother asking right don't even bother asking for the law we know you know we know when when you get to the gospel you'll be like well i could put my trust in jesus but why don't you just why don't you just give me a law i'll just follow the law it's like no, no 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 give you the law this is what it would look like we all know you can't stand up to it right and now here's the gospel mm -hmm. yeah they both have to go together you got to have you got to have both but it's just yeah. It's the law, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it the law in the letter or the, le or the law in the spirit. In one sense, you have to have the law in the letter to know what the spirit looks like. I was making a spreadsheet with something, and spreadsheet shows it's got a lot of like X's and boxes and stuff. So there's all these data points, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily see how they're connected or why there's a data point here. And also, the data point isn't what makes something true or false, it's a representation of what's behind all of that stuff. Uh, I always hear people in business talk about, like when you look at somebody's books, their books tell a story. 
-hmm. These aren't just numbers. These numbers represent, are you doing a good job here? Like, what, what, what does this money mean having it here versus not having it here? Is this enough? And that you want to have this much money here in order that this area of the business can run smoothly. Customers are happy. People uh, keep their job longer. They're making enough money, all this type of stuff. It's, are these people happy? Do you, do you serve these people and do you have their interests in your heart and want to serve and, and help them? Versus this, this says uh, $1,500. That's the correct answer. <laughs> well, but what is that? What does that mean? Uh, and the fleshing of it out, that's what Jesus is. The law is all right. the, the little data points, but then Jesus is, what does this look like in human life when you've lived it out? It's not enough just to have all this stuff on paper and to say you like it. Do you do it? And what does that look like? The literal fruit that's produced. If you want to break down everything that's going on inside of a tree that's producing fruit, you could quantify all that. Their numbers, how many cells, you know, mm -hmm. division, like the rates of change, blah, 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 how much water and quantify the number of atoms and all, all that type of stuff. You could get into that detail and all that information's out there. God obviously knows all that data. But then, like, spiritually, all of that is just summed up in you pull this apple off the tree and you bite it and it tastes good. <laughs> Like real simple, straightforward. In that sense, we're really spiritual beings. We can see things on the surface. That piece of silver that you pulled out, it looks shiny. It's like nice to look at. Somebody makes a, a drawing of something and it looks, I like looking at that versus somewhere else. At the end of the day, that's really all it gets down to is, is God happy? Does he like it? Uh, Romans 17, verse 7 and 8. Pay all to them what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So yeah, there's all these laws about debt. But then also it's supposed to be our goal to not owe anyone anything. Right. Except... To fulfill the law. That's, that's an interesting one. Uh, we didn't really go into that much. Um, you mentioned as, about uh, like how money is created is through debt. And in one sense, I think that's true in, in the sense that God... There's the question, right, about like whether the fall of mankind was... Would we know God's goodness as much as we do without that having happened. Sure. There's obviously a lot of value that God is bringing, has brought out of redeeming a lost sinner. Or if the person never sinned, would God be as great? It's kind of like in the beginning, God made a cup filled with water. But God has more water he could put into that cup, so he dumps the cup out so he can put more in. Right. And it's kind of like mankind and water is righteousness. So he dumps the righteousness out of us so that he can put more, more in. But you wouldn't have an appreciation for God putting more water in because there was already water in it to begin with. Sure. Wealth has no appreciation unless there's a debt that it's taken care of. Like, you don't know what you have until you lost it. Maybe. I think of the parable of the prodigal son. The father doesn't rejoice over the son that never left. He doesn't throw a banquet in his right. honor. Right. He throws a banquet for the one who was lost and comes back. Right. Who was dead and is now alive. Uh, in yeah. that case, also, the son who never left, he said, you're going to own everything. When I die, when I really die, now your younger brother... He declared me dead by right. asking for my, the inheritance now. But you, when I truly die, you are going to receive all things. And you know, you're going to, you know, as the firstborn, you're going to get the double inheritance and all the rest. But this son who wasted everything, treating me as dead and what, having his inheritance, he's alive. He's not, I'm not dead. He's not dead. We're going to rejoice. When you start trying to take yeah, the different pieces of it, 
Well, yes, the, the brother who stayed and was faithful. He's been he's having going, feasts this whole yeah, time. He's, right? yes, he's, yeah, he's exactly. had whatever along the way. He's he's never been the point. He's not been the reason for the feast, but it's right. been part of feasting because he's a part of the father's household. He's being faithful. And when his father truly dies, not not as being just rejected as the, as the younger son did, when he dies, then he will receive all that was intended right. for him. But now this other son who rejected everything and declared him dead. No, I'm going to rejoice in his coming back, his repentance. His repentance has brought him back from the dead. And now we're going to celebrate that fact. Would he get a, an inheritance of some kind? Doesn't say. But still, the older brother will get the inheritance that he was due because he was faithful. So where I was going to go with this verse was some people take... Uh, owed no one anything except to love one another. They take that as a law, more or less. Mm -hmm. And so they would say, oh, I will not, not ever go into debt to, say, buy a house. I, I won't get a mortgage for my house um, because owe nothing to anyone is uh, a law, in a sense. What, what's your take on that? I have my little story from Westminster days that a guy who was in our dorm, we, we lived at Beaver College. The dorm was at Beaver College in Westminster, several, a couple of miles. It was wintertime, and people would offer him rides mm -hmm. from the Westminster back to the... He would refuse because the Bible says, no, no, oh, no man anything. Oh, wow. He would refuse all rides. And, he, and if someone, he, finally someone convinced him, he would try to give them money because he did not want to owe now, he was an Anabaptist. I mean, he, was, okay. I mean, he, he had a radical view of, of things. Wow. But, just, yeah. <laughs> Ex oh, but what about, what about, what about, except to love one another? Well, Isn't that well, covered that, in loving well, one another? Well, yeah, that he was sort of rejecting right them owing he him love. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. He, didn't, he, didn't want, he didn't want to be in any kind of debt, but he also right. didn't want to receive any love. But he, right. he wouldn't see that, that he was rejecting huh. love. He saw it only as a matter of legal obligation. Wow. He missed all the grace. Hmm. Which... There is, there is an aspect to where it says, because there's obviously the person that says, oh, well, if, de if, if money and wealth is created by debt, it's like the broken window fallacy. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go around and break everybody's windows right. so that guy, way the window maker has an ex extra job and he'll right. make more money. Right, right, right. But it's taking opportunity. You can't do that Right. By taking opportunity for what would those people have spent that money on, right? Right. If they hadn't been forced to spend it on a window repair, right? So, in one sense, yeah. Go, but go looking for windows that are already broken. Don't go around saying, "Let's sin more that grace may abound." I'm going to create debt, right? So therefore, people can lend more and charge interest, and you know, because now there will be more opportunities to lend. Right. That's the warning, I think. God's saying, no, there's already infinite lending opportunities. You don't have to go looking to create right. them. Right. There's already, like you, you, you've mentioned before, Dennis, like God's system is like how God works is fractals. Mm -hmm. But you've got a thing, a circle within a circle within a circle, with, and it just goes on forever. It's like, yeah, don't worry about having to create a whole new circle. Mm -hmm. There's already another one inside the one you're working on. It was funny. I heard Jeff Bezos say this one time. He's not a believer. He's divorced and... There's all kinds of, of bad things there. But he did say one thing that made an impression on me. I'm like, it's, it's, it's astounding sometimes the level of wisdom that unbelievers mm -hmm. can attain and how it often outstrips what we have. But he said, this was opening up a new Amazon warehouse, and he said, the customer has a divine ability to always be able to be served better. Mm-hmm. Mm Anything that you can do that they like, there's no limit right. to discovering more of what they like and doing it better and more skillfully. And he said, he literally said, that ability is divine. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, that was a fascinating insight. So it's like, yeah, you don't have to go create stuff. You can give, it's like, you know, the invention of the iPhone. You can create something that solves a problem that nobody even knew that they had. Just by creating this, people always say, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's actually it's it really is profound. So so back to your question, Jonathan, which yeah. was like, I'm never gonna go into debt because of this verse. Yeah. 
in one sense, like I'm wondering if that kind of sort of applies to me. I had somebody was trying to sell me some business course or membership in something. I forget. It mm -hmm. was like it was going to be like fifteen thousand dollars up front, mm -hmm. and that was like the base package thing. And I told the guy that I wasn't willing. To, he said, "Well, just go out to a bank and just borrow that money uh -huh. to pay for it." And I told him, "I told him no," and he said. What, like worst comes to worst, you can just declare bankruptcy and you won't be mm. out anything. <laughs> and that was his sales tactic. Wow. Was like, there's no reason for you to possibly say no to this because it's free. Because huh. you can just declare bankruptcy and get out of it. That harkens back to, you know, when, yeah, when yeah, Doug yeah. said, if you, if you haven't gone declare bankruptcy three times, you have, you're not trying in American business. You don't want to go borrowing and not paying people back because that's what right. wicked people do. Right. But also, do I have an unhealthy fear of debt where I shouldn't necessarily? Talking about this verse. Oh, no one anything. Therefore, I'm never going to borrow. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to accept a bribe from anybody. I'm going to do everything hard mode. Mm -hmm. um, I have to build everything from scratch. I'm going to grow my own plants. I'm not going to go, like, if somebody wants to give me some starter seeds or... <laughs> right, or right, whatever. Right. Or a ride. I'm, I'm going to reject all that. I'm going to reject a ride. I'm going to do everything myself where is the yeah and where is the balance in that obviously i would think i would want to if i was going to borrow money i would want to borrow from believers if at yeah. all possible yeah but also realizing that in a lot of cases that's not possible right and i ask because i don't know where i stand on this one of like should i get a mortgage or should i not um i can see a little bit of both arguments um but I guess to think it through out loud a little bit, it would be strange in one sense for a strict type of law to be in the New Testament in a sense, right? Most of the upping it up notch in the New Testament is taking it to the spiritual level. Mm -hmm. Or more precisely, taking something that was in the old law and spelling it out. Or, at or having an a previous allowance for doing something bad removed. Or that. Like divorce. Which, yeah, so that would be the alternative. So I'm trying to think, because there was nothing in the old law about don't borrow money. There was a proverb that said, don't borrow money against something. There's also in the Deuteronomy 28 listing of blessings and curses. Okay. Where it says that like, if you reject God, then you will become in debt. You'll, yes. you'll be the borrower and right. not the lender. Yes. So it's definitely a curse, but it's kind of like yeah. cancer. It's not a sin to have cancer, but right. if at all possible, don't get cancer. <laughs> right. So I, I'm, yeah. So I'm trying to work out like, is this upping it a notch from, from saying, oh, we gave you, is it like we gave you the permission to, to borrow money? in the Old Testament, and now we're telling you that's not the ideal. I, th I think certainly the ideal is don't be in debt. I think it's, in one, it's either in Colossians or Ephesians, then it says, if you can avail yourself of the opportunity. Last 1 Corinthians, I get, think. Get your, buy your freedom if you yeah, can. Yeah, 1 Corinthians, does, does talk, Paul talks about mm. that. If you're, if you're one, if you can get out, fine. If you can't. That's good too. I mean, it's, it, there's there's neither one of them. They're not sinful. Do the best with what God's given you. Well, that's have the opportunity. Actually, really interesting because being a slave ultimately is owing a lot more than uh, than just mm -hmm. owe no one anything, right? It's like owing your whole life, um, right? But you don't want to go into slavery. Well, it might it might be it might be in a. A little bit of interest to give a little bit of slavery background. So, like, it, when somebody would become a slave, it could be for any type of debt. It could either yes. be from uh, like criminal debt, you stole something right. that has a definite amount, or damages that right. have a definite amount. Then the amount of the damages Monetary. has been determined in yep. court. So, it's all very definite and clear. Yep. So, but then when you would be sold into slavery to pay that, it was either for an outstanding debt, and mm -hmm. in in whatever sense, there was a clear amount of debt that was owed. Yes, and then the judge would also determine the value of your labor as a slave. 
Yeah. To say, now this is the allotted period that you have. Okay. When this period is fulfilled, this amount will be considered repaid. Gotcha. And it was the judge that would determine the amount of the value of the slave. So that that's in Israelite law. Is it also a similar case in Roman law, which Paul was talking to Roman slaves? That's a really interesting question. Uh, I know Roman slaves... I'm, I'm sure Rome had a lot of yes. bad stuff <laughs> right? about how slaves were allowed to be treated and also killed. Also probably and, some similarities. Pro probably some. Uh, in terms of debts, at Rome yeah. also might have allowed like perpetual slavery, Yeah, which was allowed in Israel except... Except for the 50 years. For the 50 year, and this. that only really came into play once, either once in a long time or for foreigners that were brought in right. enslaved their their children even could be so let's say you got some husband and wife came to you and mm -hmm. they were came in together as enslaved and then let's say they pass away their children are still yours until the year of jubilee in which case they go free okay i believe that's right Unless they could even, I don't think they could be enslaved even through Jubilee. I think that was for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was definitely, definitely that's the case. And Israelites would just be every seven years. Then. Right. So yeah, Israel had a sooner, had had gotcha. a higher turnover of freedom, and then unbelievers they still got it, but it was seven sevens. But yeah, that's a, that's a other, kind of a question I have for myself. You know, the verse before that is pay to all what is owed to them. If I have a mortgage, I can't. The only way to pay is to sell the house that I have a mortgage on and pay it, right? And so if this is an immediate sort of command, it's like if you get a mortgage for a house, yeah, you sell your house and pay the mortgage off again. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a fair way of interpreting it. I don't know. Yeah. I There's know. certainly wisdom in this too. So let's say let's say you're in debt. Let's say you got student loans for $100,000 yeah. or something. And your some some kind of opportunity comes along where you realize but some once in a lifetime a legitimate once in a lifetime opportunity comes up and you and you find out if i just borrow 10 grand i can make a quarter million mm -hmm. crazy scenario sure but i, I want to aff afford that here let's say okay i would say yeah that might be uh, assuming it works yep. That would be, I think, a wise thing to borrow money. You're already right. in debt. You're already way down low. But if you can just swim down in the ocean another five feet, you can push off a rock and get all the way back up to the surface. Right. I would say, yeah, if it's that or die, probably, you know, do that. That's the only thing I can think of. Otherwise, if you're already 100 feet down and you need to get up for a breath of air, don't swim down right, a little right, bit right, further. Right. At least start making your way back. Yeah. Unless you can see there's just something a couple more feet down. Okay, yeah, go right. go a little bit deeper and then push and, off. And hopefully you haven't fallen for some sort of mirage a few times already. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, I'm down <laughs> if you've 20 fallen more feet, for it 20 more a couple feet. times, then maybe don't do it anymore. Or you've gone down so much that even when you start coming up, you'll end up getting the bends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too, yeah, too, right. coming up too fast. Yeah, I mean, that, it's just, yeah, you always because you don't manage money properly. <laughs> even if you just taking the scenario of the mortgage, I mean, the way mortgages are sold now, it's kind of like, how much do you make? How much does the wife make? This is how much you can get, half right. a million dollars. We're, we become skilled into going yeah. into debt. But, in, <laughs> but then, but if you if you look at it, well, okay, what can I myself afford? But then, is it within a certain percentage? I mean, the rule back when I was young, half a century ago, was no more than 25% of your income. Yeah. Was your, so it, well, now people, if they were, you know, they plan for half, three quarters of right. both their incomes. Right. Uh, so then. Which, when, to be fair, I think the technological deflation does allow for that. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that I have, my other expenses, Obviously, with the monetary inflation, it's not necessarily cheaper, but as a percentage of my income, I should be paying less on my electricity bill, mm. less on my hospital bills, less on my other stuff. In theory, of course, some of it hasn't gone that way. In theory, some of my expenses should be less. Food certainly should be less because it's super cheap now. 
whereas and and just because of the integration of labor right nobody drives the tractors that grow our food we're paying nobody to drive the tractor because they're all linked to a gps which is super cheap and they drive lines back and forth across the field right like and so it is cheaper as a percentage housing land on the other hand is not because it's limited right there's only a certain amount of land in the world <laughs> well and it's also infrastructure there's there's land that you can buy for dirt cheap yeah in backwoods tennessee right but good luck oh, yeah. getting there's water still, and electricity and internet right. there's and, still room to grow in the grand scheme of things certainly in terms of available housing currently it's going to take a higher percentage of my salary and i'm not going to feel bad about that Mm -hmm. because because my food's so much cheaper in theory at least now some of the stuff hasn't hospitals should be cheaper because we're so much better at it right we know way more about the medicine and preventative measures <laughs> and yeah. preventative measures like it should be cheaper but it's not <laughs> so it, you know there's there's multiple a lot of dimensions going on and there's also the fact that there's a lot of people like the, the number of people on Earth is just growing year over year exponentially, and it has been for a long time, mm -hmm. just really within the last couple hundred years. It just mm -hmm. completely Right, the survival rate. Exploded, rates. yeah. Well, and exactly because we got so much better at making food and medicine and these other things that we can survive a lot better than mm -hmm. we used to be able to. Yeah, life expectancy used to be 35. Yeah, more than life expectancy is like childhood mortality rates, right? right? Mm -hmm. If half the kids die, for every kid, half of them die before they turn 10 or whatever it was. It's like, there's a big difference. Some of our value and what people actually want to do for a living has gotten thrown off as well. Like here, somebody was telling me the other day that there are uh, two plumbers in the hmm. whole city. Not two plumbing companies, but two, two plumbers. Well, two plumbing companies, but okay. they have very small... Very like, few employees. Like a couple couple guys. Okay. Yeah. Two or three guys. Yeah. If you don't have something that's an emergency, you're mo like months out. Right. And they can only get to things that are emergencies right now. Uh-huh. So if you want to go be a plumber, you can make really good money, but nobody wants to be a plumber. And the same thing with like construction companies or building houses and infrastructure mm -hmm. and stuff. Nobody wants to do that. Well... There's shortages in... And you can make really good money doing a lot of that so stuff. So construction's really interesting because I've seen a lot of the the pay for construction. It's quite low out here. It seems like mm. everyone wants good quality construction, but it seems like no one's willing to pay for it. I don't know if the companies are gouging their employees or if the just everything's out of whack, but it's like, I can believe plumbers and electricians make good wages out here, but it's like, from what I've seen of job postings, hmm. the constructions. I wonder how much don't. of that is just because of the cost of wood right now. Yeah, so I they've got to cut costs somewhere else. Uh, well, no, maybe it I was think, the same even before. I think I think construction people just never made much money out here, and the housing prices go up. But I don't know. I, but I, but I also nobody's why. willing to pay those prices. So right, 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 right. Yeah. Mm. Comment on the plumbing. If, if there's only two, I mean, there's Paulson and some another person a week. When we moved here in June, my wife noticed there's no spigot outside for water. We can water our plants and grass. So she called the guy. He returned the call two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. They are that busy. Wow. And he, he's, I guess... Well, my, my cynical self said he was going back through last year's stuff. Saying, what, 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 what income did I miss? But yeah, no. kind of, he just now got to our request from last June. Whew. So, I mean, if there's only two guys in town, two plumbing services, then yeah, obviously yeah, it's whatever needs to be done. But then as they go through their backlog, they just got, and if they're that, I mean, <laughs> that's incredible. I mean, I, and the other thing I noticed is I have to get some periodontal work done. There's a periodontist, and the rest of them are all up north getting in and mm -hmm. getting stuff, and there's a lack of hygienists. 
those are not the careers that they're foisting on the kids going into university. Right. They want a liberal arts major. Yeah. yeah they, they do. And somewhat. you can't really do anything. You could be an English teacher. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, it's not a it's not a romantic career choice to be a plumber because right. pl plumbers are, pun intended, the butt of all the jokes. Oh yeah. And yeah, but you make really good money, and oh, yeah. you'll be the honored guest at many a household, <laughs> right. just for being a plumber. If you guys need to leave, I don't blame you. You've been here over three and a half hours, so oh, oh, it wow. been that long. <laughs> Ten thirty, almost. <laughs> Cut out at least half of what I said because I got bit rambly. <laughs> I think we all did. That's good, though. You made it to the end, so what's this special project I mentioned at the beginning? Some of you may be familiar with Steven Crowder and how he'll set up a table at college campuses and ask a question or put forth a challenge. His challenge is, uh, change my mind. So it'll be something like, biological males should not compete in women's sports. Change my mind. I'd like to take a similar tack to that and I really appreciate the fact that he sits down and is generally very polite and wants to understand the other person. And that can really open up a lot of room for discussion. And so I'd like to do the same thing. If you want to see an example of what I'm talking about with some of the banners, you can go to voluntarytheocracy.org slash support. It'll tell you a little bit more about it there. But there are a few pieces of equipment that I need. Banners cost money. I need some GoPro cameras, different things like that, different microphones, a microphone transmitter. Some of this stuff has already been donated. So if you'd like to chip in a little bit extra and help out with it, you can see the full list of things we still need that haven't been crossed off the list yet. And there's a form there where you can donate. So everything is, I believe, a unique amount. So if you want to cover a particular piece of equipment, just put in that specific amount and I'll cross that off the list. Excited to get this underway starting beginning of the next school year. Deadline for this would probably be mid-August to get all the equipment and start recording. Voluntarytheocracy.org slash support. Or you can email me at theocrat, T-H-E-E-O-C-R-A-T, at gmail.com.